Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Turnips Digest, starting right on time once again at 8 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time, Saturday morning. Um, yeah, I we will have one more guest joining us, and uh, I will save my shilling until after he joins. Uh, but before then, oh, or perfect timing, he's with us right now. So um, I'll start my shilling now then. Um, just to get it out of the way. If you like what I do, um, if you would uh, like to support or contribute or anything like that, um, there is a subscribe star link in the description. Uh, you can give a very small amount of money. I think it's three, five, or seven dollars. Um, you know, it's very much appreciated. None of it goes to Alphabet, as far as I'm aware. And uh, I get a bigger cut than if we were to uh, have super chats on YouTube. Um, with all that being said, you can also find me in the Find My Friends link in the description, which is also uh, how I have uh, attributed uh, AM and Panama Hat, who are both joining me this morning. Uh, we will just, I guess, circle around clockwise. How are you, AM? Hello, Turnip. I'm, I'm fine. Happy to be here. Very good. I, and I'm very happy that you're here as well, because uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you have uh, very well established yourself as the um, history channel of the... Uh, of the dissidents, you know, so so the fact that you would come on to the uh, you know cozy uh, you know more narrative driven history group uh, makes me very happy. <laughs> well, well, I'm I'm very flattered by that. I'm sure uh, Thomas Seven Seven sort of you know takes the cape when it comes to the dissident historian, but I think for someone who's a little bit more conservative than you're used to, I suppose yes, I could constitute <laughs> a, a weird little niche on YouTube. But thank you very much. Yes, and yeah. Hopefully, I don't need to say this, but for anyone that is watching that is not aware of Apostolic Majesty, um, check out his channel. Like I said, the Find My Friends link in the description will uh, lead to uh, all of the works of anyone that you can find on there. Um, Apostolic Majesty has a very, very comprehensive series uh, running through basically Charlemagne to, uh, I believe you stop after, just slightly after the French Revolution and Napoleon. Uh, was that the cutoff point? Yeah, uh, 1815. So we'll yeah. actually start before Charlemagne. We start before the Romans even. So uh, right. 2,000 right. years, a long time. So very good, very comprehensive. Goes over many different uh, technicalities and uh, uh, minute details that you might miss uh, that are otherwise very interesting. Uh, things that you definitely will not learn in your uh, class. I, I should offer that. You know, that, that's usually the biggest draw that our historians have is you will learn the things you will not learn in school. Um, and usually it's pretty good. So um, go check him out. And we're also joined by uh, Panama Hat, another very good historian in our spheres. How are you doing, sir? Uh, I'm doing doing very, very well, thank you. It's uh, fantastic to be back on here as always. Uh, just barely made it back on time. Um, from all the things that are happening here. And uh, it's wonderful to be here with the Apostolic Majesty, who I just recently uh, streamed with on the topic of um, Valkyrie, um, starring Tom Cruise, um, and the historical authenticity of that of that film, or, 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 or perhaps not so much. Yeah, fantastic. I didn't actually catch up with that because my, uh, <laughs> my last couple of weeks have been absolutely insane with the uh, stuff that I've been doing. <laughs> right. um, but... Yeah, you know, as always, I will eventually get to the back catalog, even if it's like you know four months late. <laughs> I think is the, uh, I think that was the last uh, or the latest thing that I caught from one of our guys was a uh, you know something released four months ago. So that was a that was that, and you know, yeah, just for something funny, uh, people always pigeonhole me for like the Protestant work ethic, starting right at eight o'clock a.m. on streams. Um, I think this is the first time that the uh, Protestant panel has been uh, outnumbered by the Catholic panel. Uh, <laughs> yes, on, on this channel, that would be a first, yes. <laughs> so um, that's uh, something that we can look forward to here. But um, that might actually tie into the topic that we are discussing today. Um, this is, you know, I've only seen... Uh, Material ranging from brief overviews, like you might find in a uh, intro to history class, if you took something related to Chinese history, or something very you know in depth and uh, high detail. Um, this is a topic that I can't really find a good medium uh, level source on. You know, uh, something that could uh, balance the two, much like you can find for a lot of American history. You know, you won't get a uh, 
you know, spreadsheets of dates unless you want that and you won't get basic history. You can find a lot of mid-level stuff. I'm sure English history is probably the same, uh, probably the same with a lot of medieval history, the narratives presented. Um, China and her revolutions ranging from, you know, the 1900s all the way, or 1900 until about 1950 or so, um, I can't find very much sort of middle level history on there, um, which is why we're here today, because not only can we provide something like that, which is, uh, you know, the overview, um, the narrative, and then going in depth from there uh, without, you know, uh, going too far over people's heads. Um, but both of you are also very uh, traditional, very conservative, reactionary even. Um, and I don't think I have seen a reactionary cover this time period. Usually it's the West, um, but I haven't seen a full overview of uh, you know, the revolutions in China. Uh, but perhaps you two have? Well, I would, um, I would interject and say that, at least personally speaking, um, when we speak about authentic reaction, what we're really talking about is um, something that occurs in Europe, essentially. That, of course, there are certain political truths that ring true universally but generally we talk about europe and the thing about talking about china um specifically is that you're not just talking about another country you're talking about another civilization that's really what china is that's the mistake people people tend to make with it is that it's not it's not a country or an entity in the same way that say france is or spain is or you know even the uk is it's a it's a different thing altogether um that's at least part of the reason why um like for example i've talked quite a bit about the culture and the literature of um japan before um because i find that there's quite a bit more comparison to be had there than there is with the chinese sort of thing um not that i'm ignorant of it per se it's just you're dealing with something almost totally alien in so many ways i think Right, and perhaps uh, Apostolic Majesty c could correct me on this, being as he is a he, he has been in uh, history the field uh, for much longer than I have. But it seems to me every time I delve into it, there's a disclaimer sort of at the start of most work saying, uh, you know, unless you really speak the language and live there and like know the people, uh, this culture is very hard to uh, pierce. Um, so there's going to be some stuff that is either incomplete or incorrect in the analysis. Uh, have have you guys, uh, especially AM, have you uh, come across the disclaimers like that for uh, this topic? Well, that's not just a disclaimer for Chinese history. That's a disclaimer for all non-English speaking history and ever more prevalent. And rightly so, if you uh, believe in getting to the primary sources and also not only that, but understanding historical memory and historiography. So whilst I agree with that, I think we can at least stab and try to come up with a an overview which can provide some sort of entry point into this topic, if nothing completely exhaustive. Fantastic, and that's a uh, that's what I'm aiming for as well, um, because I uh, <laughs> I do wonder whenever I do see that because it, like you said, it is very true. But uh, you know, I wonder how much that could just be used as an excuse not to uh, go farther. <laughs> but perhaps that's just me being cynical towards uh, historians as a uh, or modern historians as a group rather. Well, you can be completely, you know, sufficient from a linguistic point of view, but you can have no sort of hermeneutic, no talent right. when it comes to interpretation. So it requires a combination of these skills. And the frustrating thing about being a historian is that it does require quite a lot in the way of sort of essential skills. So it would help if you have like an army of researchers and translators on right. hand to help you. And I, I suppose that might be... Uh might be an upside of say having a uh, commissioned research um just because uh, if i if my uh, knowledge of a uh, older historiography or older historians uh serves correctly you know oftentimes they would be employed by someone that was a uh, wealthier as opposed to a university system where you have to fight for funding or at least like here but uh perhaps that could be a romanticized view um <laughs> i think if i to start this um and try to like thrust into what we're going to discuss today. Panava brings up the idea that China is a different civilizational force. I still think you can attribute the idea of authentic reaction in a perennialist philosophy. And you have to also think when looking at Japan, 
that Japan from the 8th century is in many ways an offshoot of Chinese culture that generated its own fundamental sort of distinctions, its own fundamental character, which in any ways, many ways is a mirror in the East of feudalism in the West. But regarding China, what is fascinating about this period, the whole topic of revolutions is a result of the conflict between East and West, of the West imposing itself and a new vision of China onto an ancient civilizational force and how Chinese in particular take these ideas and try to use it to transform our conception of China as a civilization itself. So I think just that's a point that should underlie this conversation. Right. And yeah, you know, that, that should, that could be made a uh, much, a very simple point if you want to think about it in a different way. Uh, you can try to go back through uh, Chinese history before it had contact or great contact with the West. Um, and try to imagine someone calling themselves a, like a revolutionary, you know, someone trying to suggest that the society should be led without, say, you know, the different religious systems and bureaucracies and uh, mandates but, but, that exist. But, this this, but this is the fascinating thing about Chinese history is that Chinese history is cyclical and has this expectation right. that it should be cyclical. China is a China is in, in terms of like a geography, in terms of a civilizational force, goes back you know, thousands of years. But in terms of a continuity of Chinese civilization, you can really say it begins in the third century BC. After that, you have a successive cycle of the rise and fall of various dynasties. And it is possible that these dynasties could be started by anyone. And indeed, you could say that once that mandate of heaven is revoked, that the mandate could be bestowed on anyone, indeed, of any ethnicity. So it's not been a matter either that you've had simple native dynasties. In fact, non-native dynasties have, you can say, been assimilated into this idea of Chinese civilization, as would be the case with Kublai Khan, and the Mongols, and the Yuan, and as was the case with China's last great imperial dynasty, which was the Qing dynasty, which were founded by a group called the Zhershans, who Reassimilated as Manchus in the north, what is now the northeast of China, and they established one of the greatest, the largest of all Chinese dynasties, the Qing dynasty. And you could say roughly that during the 18th century, it still was the biggest economy, the largest population on earth, and it had a series of quite successful emperors. The last great emperor of Qing was Qianlong, who ruled for over 60 years. And then in the 19th century, everything goes horribly wrong. And I think that's probably what we're going to be discussing today. Um, can I, one last remark on China again, I know that AM, you have far more uh, in-depth knowledge on this. So f please feel free to push back if I'm getting this wrong, but there's, there's something about China that's striking pretty much more so than most other places. It seems is this is the total, the total self-belief in the Chinese way of life and the Chinese, um, system i suppose would, would would be the word you know the this this idea that that china is the most powerful the most wealthy the most great empire on earth and that cannot possibly be wrong yes uh the best way to describe it is as a roman empire that never ended and even in the west the idea of rome is transmuted you can say in weaker iterations to other forces such as the Holy Roman Empire, and then even sort of revived during the French Revolution. The idea of Rome never goes away, but the idea of Rome as a as a territory, as an empire, representing roughly the same amount of territory, and some form of continuity of government, albeit through a successive state that we see in China, that doesn't really exist in the West. But it very much exists in China, and this is baked into the etymology of China, because in China, the, ch the word for China means Zhongguo, which means Middle Kingdom. So literally, it is the foundational state. It is not only the sort of the state beneath heaven, because of course the mandate is derived from heaven, but it represents the center of the world in which all other states, in the same way you can say Greek civilization and non-Greek civilization, barbarians, and everyone must pay into this tributary system where one acknowledges the supremacy of the Chinese state. Yes. And... Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's also why the uh, the frontier, the territory, can constantly uh, shift. Uh, like, if you look at historical maps, the borders of whatever Chinese di Chinese dynasty exists, it can shift. Um, but that's not seen as some extreme loss to the core territory of China just because the concept is so large, as opposed to, like, if uh, 
France were to lose part of its territory or if England were to lose part of its? Well, there is a core. Um, effectively, you have two main or three, you could say, main river valleys which constitute Chinese civilization or proper. There's the Yellow River, which is the source of Chinese civilization around the city of Chang'an. In the south, you have the Yangtze. And in the extreme south, you have the Pearl River, which is around, in, in Western sort of language, the city of Canton, which is now the city of Guangzhou. So these rivers form the sort of where the greatest cities are and where the civilizations tend to rise and fall. You have empires from the south and you have empires in the north. And you even have this reflected in the cities, such as Beijing, which literally means northern capital whereas Nanjing means southern capital, and often the names would actually change based on the position they occupy within a dynasty. So if the country was run from the south, Beijing would become Beiping, which just means northern pacified city, etc., etc. So you have all of these aspects where the center of power is changing, you know, it can be in Chang'an as it was with the Tang dynasty, which is in the west of China, it can be in Nanjing, what can be in other cities like Hangzhou, which was the capital of the Song dynasty, but it always tends to represent this territory since at least the Sui dynasty in the 8th century. So this core around the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers. And regarding this expansion, the greatest of the Chinese dynasty is like the Tang dynasty, would go far west, so occupying what is now Xinjiang, East Turkestan, and they would get to cities such as Balkh and Urganch and Samarkand in Central Asia, and they would actually get into conflict with the growing Muslim empires, the Abbasid Caliphate, for example. Um, what the Qing dynasty does is it expands out of this central area and creates this great inner Asian empire. So the borders of China before 1860 are absolutely expansive. They're actually a lot larger than they are today. And you can even say that the enlarged China that we see with the north, uh, the northeastern territories, with Xinjiang, with Inner Mongolia, even territories in Yunnan, is a represent you could say a continuity of the great imperial legacy of the Qing Dynasty in particular. Alrighty, and uh, anything else to add, uh, Mr. Hat, before we uh, start off with sort of like the you know, early um, beginnings of the. Topic? I was. It's not wholly relevant now, but I was going to make a comment on the incredible chauvinism that seems to radiate from the Chinese in general um, throughout their history and now, where, you know, even even in the very worst sort of depths of the of the great humiliation or in the sort of warlord era, there is this belief that sort of this is all just a big temporary embarrassment and that, of course, China and the Chinese are sort of, they're still somehow the greatest empire with the greatest people in the greatest ways, you know. Um, I don't know if AM would disagree with that, but I think it's an important aspect of, of the outlook of the Chinese in, in general, it seems, where it's part of the, it's like their, their, their relationship with Western ideas seems almost an opposite to something like, say, Japan, where the Japanese basically... Uh, as, as, as has already been been said, they adopt Chinese culture fairly early on um, and do make it their own somewhat. And then come the 1860s, they also they they then they then look look at the West and say, well, we 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 must we must uh, we must sort of adapt or die. So in they very rapidly embrace basically all the Western ideas they can, um, both materially and intellectually. Whereas China, you know, it's the, the the process is completely different because the outlook is completely different. You know, even in even in the kind of the height of sort of Qing dynasty decadence, there's this slowness to begin begin to adopt any any of these ideas because, well, sort of why why would they? And of course, it's not helped by the government of the late Qing dynasty, which we will get into, but. I think that more so than just the individual um, characters in charge, um, this, this, as I said, this, this, this chauvinism for what is considered to be the Chinese way versus Western ways, or kind of any any real outside way, is is apparent. It's it's just the I, I do think this is something of a of a 
of a unique character to the to the Chinese almost. Um, so um, I was actually going to say uh, I'm glad that you articulated. We should save that because we are going to start kind of with the obviously brief brief overview of the Opium Wars. And we're going to get into modernization because you can't really talk about the upheaval in China without the attempts or the lack no. thereof to modernize. It was it necessary, was it vital, all this other stuff. Um, and that is definitely one of the uh, narratives that gets passed around. That was even the one that I was taught in school. Um, and I, I have a feeling we will evaluate all the different ways of uh, looking at China um, and its relationship to Western ideas and technology uh, when we... Uh, Probably in about 15 minutes, in all honesty. Um, does, that, does that sound all right? Sounds fine to me. All righty. So, um, you know, there, there is a question of if you're going to talk about the upheaval in China, where where do you start? You know, how, yeah. how far back do you go? And that's a, a question for any historian is, a, you know, what, if, how well, far I mean, do you go back to test when, the uh, genesis of something? When is there not upheaval in China? <laughs> <laughs> so, um I have a feeling that if we give a brief overview of the Opium Wars, because that's kind of its own topic with its own causes, um, you know, we just go from you know the brief start of the Opium Wars to modernization attempts, um, and then start start to really focus around 1890. Does that sound good to both of you? Yes, I, I could do that very quickly if you want. I mean, regarding pl places where this start. Uh, the sort of the the appropriate sort of historiographical delineator always tends to start with the McCartney Embassy in 1793, where Britain sends its first envoy to China, and we have this clash between the growing British Empire, which at this point is expanding into India and will, over the course of the next few decades, co conquer the entirety of India or force it into a state of submission, and. We have very many sort of apocryphal moments from this, such as the fact that the relationship failed because McCartney refused to do the kowtow, etc. And then we have Chen Long's responses to the various gifts he's received that China has no need of your manufactured goods because this, West, of course, is Western, Western knickknacks. <laughs> yes, Western knickknacks, effectively. Yeah, and isn't, isn't um, that apocryphal story the one where he's offered like telescopes and various different types of calculators and whatnot and golden watches? And things. Yeah. And then he just, yeah, you know, throws it off. Yes, yes. I also, uh, I also very much like the story that they eventually compromise, so that um, I believe every time he kowtows, a Chinese official of equal rank must kowtow to a portrait of King George the um, <laughs> Third. I again, I've I've no idea how, how how true that is, but that's all. That's always one of the stories that crops up. Um, I I would say for um, just comment on time. Uh, I don't know about you chaps, but uh, I am i don't have anything else to do today in particular, so I don't mind hanging around, because since the topic is both fascinating and complicated, um, if if we have time, uh, I wouldn't mind AM if you, you know, went into as much detail as you wanted um, in the lead up, um, entirely depending on how, entirely depending on how, how free you are right now, though. Um, because on on this channel we we don't shy away from uh, autistic levels of, of detail and things. That's that's basically why we started it. So. All right. Well, um, uh, uh, we'll see how we do. Um, right. I, I'm I'm running off fumes here, so uh, I may not I may not remember <laughs> a lot, but but uh, I'll, I'll try and yeah I'll try and keep up. Um. So. I'm glad that's sorted out. Uh, so you say those stories were apocryphal. Um, is that because we don't necessarily have a direct source of them, or were they literally just no, fabrications? No, in, in the sense of the significance of... Okay, all right. Um, because there's also another quote from McCartney saying that the Qing dynasty is effectively a majestic first rate. Um, it can maneuver sort of barely but it can stay afloat and all it would take would be one thorough broadside in order to sink it. Um, the, the reason I, I bring up all of this is because the main emphasis here is that superficially under Qin Long, China looks incredibly imposing and powerful, almost impregnable, even at that stage in the development, you could say the, the great um, uh, dichotomy between Western civilization and everywhere else. Because, like I said, China had a population of around 400 million, etc. Uh, Qianlong was a great campaigning emperor, so he had subjugated the 
inner Asians, the Mongolians, uh, the Tibetans, uh, the in Xinjiang, uh, but he hadn't conquered Vietnam. So on all of this, you know, why is this China, which is superficially powerful? Um, why is it superficially powerful? Well, just to bring back to Chien Long, we have the example of uh, He Xin, who is the Grand Chancellor of Chien Long. We have an entire bureaucratic apparatus in China, which is becoming more and more decentralized, and at the same time, more and more corrupt. He Shen is notorious for his levels of corruption. And when Qing Long dies, we don't have another great imperial head um, ever again. Throughout the 19th century, China is beholden to these rather weak imperial figures to the extent that we have a, a radical innovation in the government from the 1860s onwards. And so it's in this context of a China which is, you can say, arrested, petrified in many senses, that is aware of Western innovations because we have the city of Canton, which is still trading. We have Jesuit missionaries coming into China. Um, at the same, and we even have uh, the great palace outside of the Forbidden City. Everyone knows about the Forbidden City, but few have heard of Yuan, Yuan Ming Yuan, uh, which was the old Summer Palace. In the Summer Palace, you had a Western style pavilion. You even had uh, Western contractions. I believe there was even um, a, 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 a water heating device or um, some sort of steam engine there. But all of these things were just novelties imported and they didn't reflect any genuine desire part of the imperial system to innovate and reform the army. So when we have an expansionist British empire, which is expanding the idea of free trade and really what that means is forcing British goods into every market possible, China is seen as the gold standard of that because China is the largest population on earth and so a seemingly inexhaustible supply of people to sell to. It also has a huge amount of tea and other um, natural resources. So whilst Britain has ex expanded into its mercantile interests into Latin America, into the Ottoman Empire, into the coast of Africa, having subjugated most of India, etc., etc. China, along with Japan and Korea, remain these great untapped resources. And just to put it very bluntly, this is the context for the Opium Wars in terms of establishing Britain as a major maritime industrial power, which is technologically advanced compared to China, and a China which seems unwilling or unable to address this threat and a lack of political will from the center and a collapsing administration. And the consequence of this decentralization also means that there isn't really even a sense of a professional standing army in China at the same time. So, yeah. So um, just to go into that, uh, the story that I usually got taught about the Opium Wars was twofold. Um, one was kind of what you just said, you know, there's this overarching uh, strategy of Britain just to you know, force open markets. Britain was highly industrialized, had a lot of the world's good under its belt, a lot of the world's goods under its belt, sorry. Um, as you were saying, they're expanding into India. They had holdings in, you know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Africa, um, and back home as well. So they have a plethora of goods of which they can, you know, trade with other people. It made the empire very wealthy, et cetera. Um, you know, that whole narrative, and therefore they had to invade China to open the markets. Um, and then there was sort of like the micro narrative, you know, why did it actually start? And the uh, it was the opium trader in China that had been in violation of Chinese law against trading opium, if I remember correctly, who was then arrested. And the British embassy insisted he be tried under British laws. Is that the, uh, just for like, is that small, you know, event narrative correct there? Um, I can't quite remember exactly the details. It's been such a long time, but you're essentially correct in the sense that it does involve opium and opium stands as the pretext in the sense that China did have these moralizing laws. It also tried to crack down on Western trade outside of the city of Canton. You also bring up the idea of extraterritoriality and the idea that English merchants operating in China shouldn't be subject to native laws. All of these things are very important and will play a role in not just the Opium Wars, but the entire political makeup of China. It also doesn't help that you have one of the most bellicose British prime ministers of all time, 
who was foreign minister at the time, who was Viscount Palmerston. All of these factors and the fact that Britain has the maritime capacity enable the facilitation of these conflicts. And from the late 1830s into 1842, we have the first so-called of these unequal treaties between China and the West, the Nanking arrangements, which establishes in principle many of the things which which you've already brought up. Uh, it also establishes the first element, I believe, of the Hong Kong lease, um, which will be the first land holding of Britain, not the first land holding of a European power, because Macau had already been ceded to the Portuguese even before the Qing dynasty came into existence. So this would have been during the, uh, the late Ming dynasty. It is also important to note um, a, a bit against um, uh, what Hat was saying earlier about Japan and China is that Japan had an almost identical system operating at the same time, except they had pushed out the Portuguese and instead they invited the Dutch to basically fill that uh, void which had been left. And in that case, it wasn't Macau in the Canton sphere and the Pearl River. It was instead the city of Nagasaki. Um, but essentially they operated on the same terms, which is we'll let a bit of the West in, but everything has to be controlled by the center. And what the British demonstrate, as what the Americans will demonstrate some decade later, is they are in a position, militarily powerful position, to be able to force the issue and impose a situation on the Chinese who do not have a military or a naval capacity to effectively resist them. So all of their supposed strengths in terms of their territory, their strategic depth, their population, all of these things resort to naught when a foreign navy is basically allowed to bomb your cities on the coast with impunity, as was the case with the British. So on the topic of uh, European holdings and uh, Eastern Asia, um, so the, as you mentioned, um, usually what would happen is that central government or whoever actually had power, whoever that may be at the time, um, would lease basically a city that would, uh, if I remember correctly, it starts at first with trading rights and then eventually it just becomes, uh, you know, the, the Europeans can govern the city. Uh, I think Macau was a bit more direct, but uh, um, if I remember correctly, the Portuguese and the Dutch in Japan were a little bit more uh, loose with how that was uh, conducted. Um, does it matter from the perspective of China or Japan which Europeans you have trading there or are they all kind of like the same outside influence? It matters in the sense that they represent an imbalance in power. So, for example, the Portuguese have been there and Jesuit missionaries have been there for centuries up until now. But the Portuguese weren't a power strong enough to be able to impose the situation. They hadn't also adopted this zealous posture on free trade, which Britain had recently done and will continue to do with the revocation of the Corn Laws. So it does matter in the sense that they're not just confronting any European power, they're confronting the main European power, which has spent the last hundred years consolidating their position and represents an existential threat, both ideologically in terms of what Britain represents and technologically, more so than, the fact, than any threat that China has possibly ever faced before, stronger even than the Mongols, because when the Mongols came, Chinese culture ultimately assimilated them. Whereas with Britain, we're seeing an opposite phenomenon. And one last thing as well. Um, it's my understanding that, um, let me see if I can phrase this correctly. So when you have these uh, European powers that are interacting with the East Asians, um, you know, there is a comparison to be made. You know, these markets were closed, obviously, protectionism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's my understanding the East Asians, as opposed to many of the European countries, did not do so for economic reasons, um, because there's a lot of European philosophies like mercantilism or the different forms of protectionism that would grow thereafter that said, we do this because it will strengthen the country. Uh, it's From what I read of this, the East Asians seem to do this because of uh, you know theological or moral reasons as opposed to uh, you know national strength or material or anything like that. Is that too far of a simplification? I think you have to view this in the sense that all of these ideas are reinforcing. So controlling who, who is allowed into your country and what ideas they disseminate allows you to maintain strict central control. Whereas Christianity, of course, is a universalist philosophy and they come in and they want to convert your population. So this is seen as a direct attack on the central authority. 
this has to be also placed in the context that the Taoist Buddhist Confucian sort of philosophies, which permeate not just in uh, Japan and China at the same time, um, are normally sort of more resilient in terms of adopting various ideas. But in the case of Christianity, a line is drawn. In the case of Japan, it was so violent that they literally minted images of the Virgin Mary to have people ritually stamp on them in the aftermath of a Catholic uprising in the early part of the 17th century. Because in the preceding century, there had been a glut of missionary activity as a result of, you can say, a lack of central authority. But when there is a reinforcement of that central authority, a reconsolidation, this idea of anti-Western edicts or anti-Christian edicts are enforced in order to reinforce that central authority. And really the fact that the opium war is allowed to happen and the fact that the system breaks and all of a sudden missionaries are allowed into China for the first time and will be given this legal protection which they didn't have before is accelerating this idea of the delegitimization of the Chinese state and accelerating this process of decentralization. Alrighty, and then uh, one, I know I said the last one would be the last one, but uh, I, I do I just have a uh, question about the practicality of things. Um, so you illustrated this with Japan, just how militant it was in China um, with the ban on Christian missionaries and stuff like that. How would you practically um, enforce that? Is Christianity as a whole banned? Is it just the missionaries? Uh, you know, What does that look like, or is that too far out of the... Uh... Well, well, this is why naval control is so important because you confine it to various cities and you can monitor uh, specific activities. Um, this is why you have the the port cities of Canton and Nagasaki as the only acceptable way because it's a way of bringing a little bit in and uh, enabling you to control it. But when you lose control of your coastal defenses, as was what happens with both China and Japan, there is no way of enforcing it. And so what you're seeing is really a reflection of the new reality in which China is unable to seriously enforce this. And so as a result of this military fiat is forced into this new situation, hence why it's called the century of humiliation. All righty, and that's, a, that's about all I had there. Um, Mr. Hat, anything else before we uh, sort of move on in the story um, here no not especially um i think pretty much everything everything that that i know which is fairly modest was covered there um sorry not too much to add uh, but there, there is another important consideration uh, because i'm trying to bridge this between where you want to go from the 1890s right. and now uh, quite a lot happens in between right that, right i know, understand and I... Uh, which which is quite severe and it, it lends to this idea to missionaries in the opium war so i just want to mm -hmm. bring on to this tangent before we forget yes. um so the opium wars finish and when was it Eight, um, 1842 and within the next two decades you have some of the most violent uprisings not just in the history of china uh, but in the history of all of you all of human history um, and you have another opium war, because it's not only Britain that's getting involved, but Britain's lackey at this point, which was uh, the Second French Empire, is also getting in on the act and trying to expand and gain its own concessions and its own territory. So during the 1850s, you have a uprising which is inspired by, you can say, the permutation of Christianity with the with uh, Hong Shikuan or Ren Kun. Uh, it was this is this anomaly because what whilst you brought up this idea panama about chinese chauvinism this has to be placed in the context that china was under a foreign dynasty a manchurian dynasty and so when you have all these ideas which are already prevalent in chinese civilization like the loss of the mandate of heaven and you associate it with modern european nationalism and you also associate it with the idea that the foreign dynasty is responsible for this national humiliation. And then you have the permutation of these new foreign ideas. It creates a perfect storm with which to create the first serious challenge to the Qing dynasty, which could potentially have overthrown it far sooner than we see in real history, which right. is the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, okay. And what Ren Kun represented, I mean, he he, start, he was basically a dissatisfied uh, uh, Imperial examination reject yes. who, went, <laughs> who um, received a vision and believed that he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So as to represent, and then, and then thirty million people died. 
basically. Yes, as if to represent these odd bits of uh, Chinese syncretism, which f uh, culminate into this movement. And as a result of this, a new state, the so-called Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, with four corners, is created in the heart of China in the south, around uh, Jiangsu and, uh, and Zhejiang, um, and the city of Nanjing, of course, which became and Taiping. Um, and this really posed a, a, a conundrum for the West, because at first they were willing to accept this fact and say, actually, no, the Chinese are going to tear themselves apart. Let's get in on this and carve out more spheres of influence. And this is where we have the second opium war. And this it's really... The... This is the origin of one uh, Chinese Gordon, isn't it? Who will later die on the Nile. Um, yes, or, exactly. But just before that, just, just 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 getting into the Second Opium War, um, which happens around the same time. I think it's six years into the uh, the Taiping Revolution. During this war, several things happen. Russia also comes in and establishes an influence in the north. Russia, in oh. fact, since. Sorry, I should have uh, stopped this earlier, but I uh, saw something come up. Um, before we get on to specifically the aftermath of Taiping, and I don't want to dwell too terribly much on this, it is worth um, just giving a feel for what this is like. Uh, could we um, do, could, do uh, before I uh, you know do this myself? Do either of you two um, know sort of like the flavor of a uh, syncretic Christianity, and uh, I believe it was also Confucianism that was uh, combined with, because um, uh, China had multiple. Uh, religious systems at the time. I could be getting that wrong. Uh, do either of you two know the beliefs of the uh, of the movement here? Um, from what I understand, um, they weren't really what we would call Western Christian. Um, <laughs> no, they, no, they, they were the, the well, the, 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 the beliefs of the typing rebels specifically were a mix of kind of um, Biblical Christianity, Confucianism, Taoism, and kind of, uh, I suppose we'd call it, you could label it as kind of um, millenarian, perhaps. Um, and I believe that they also worked in various Chinese folk gods and Chinese traditional gods as well. Um the I, I believe that the, from 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 a book I read on the subject some time ago, the, the the missionaries who observed it looked down on it as basically a kind of barbaric uh, sort of warlord movement. I believe um, they did not see it as authentically Christian in any way. Right, and I was a. Uh, there's a lot of parallels that you can draw here, sort of with the syncretism. Um, to what would happen when you when a lot of the European and later American powers tried to Christianize the uh, Indians over here, um, because they would combine a lot of their folk religion with Christianity, and it would end up just turning into this sort of you know mush basically of uh, it's not really Christian, but it's also not really you know the old native system either. I, I, um, I don't suppose any of them tried to proclaim themselves the well. Yeah, that's the, I mean, th that is the difference here. Um, yeah. But it is also worth <laughs> noting. Um, a lot of their Christian influence seems to have been looking at very specific cases of the early church, if I understand correctly, uh, which meant that they would uh, hold, the, they mandated that you would hold property in common. Uh, there was a lot more equality decreed um, that you wouldn't find necessarily in other states and definitely not in China at the time. Uh, you know, sort of like the the narratives that you would hear about the early church now from various uh, liberal groups, but perhaps I am, that is an oversimplification. Well, um, there, there, are two, there, there are two sort of figures. Um, one is Robert Morrison, and one is uh, Edwin Stevens. And this, if anything, reflects the point I was bringing up earlier about the problem with foreign missionaries. I mean, both of these missionaries were confined, as I mentioned, but it was just sufficient in the few years running up to the first opium war to have access to um, uh, Hong Ji Kuan and to represent this element of radicalism. But yes, you're right. It, it represents these more radical American sort of congregationalist egalitarian sects together with aspects of Chinese folklore and trying to incorporate the idea of the celestial emperor, the, the Shuang, the into the Holy Trinity at the same time. So uh, for, for a Christian, yes, it is this uh, uh, Frankenstein's monster of a religion, but at the same time, 
it represents all of these subversive elements and also you know a fundamental hatred of Qing of the Qing dynasty as well. So it's also a Chinese nationalist movement incorporating these elements which you can say are hostile to the status quo in as far as they represent a an attempt at restoration or revival of Chinese civilization in a really odd sense, but I really think that's what they're trying to get across. Um, you know, it becomes very degenerate towards the end, and you have uh, the the heavenly king just sitting in his uh, his uh, palace in the south, you know, having sex with as many prostitutes as possible. But at the time, that's why I believe it had such a great appeal because it's piggybacked off the sense of national humiliation, incorporating elements of European nationalism and European Christianity to create this Frankenstein's monster of religion, which results in this attempt to overthrow the Qing dynasty. And the reason it doesn't succeed is because you have the Second Opium War, China, Japan gets, sorry, Russia gets involved, France gets involved, Britain gets involved. And this culminates with, um, the destruction of Yuan Ming Yuang, or the desecration of the uh, the old summer palace. And after this point, it really does seem apparent that you also have the death of the last cognizant sort of emperor of China at this time, that the Qing dynasty is going to collapse. So rather than allow the Qing dynasty to collapse and invite complete bedlam and anarchy, and devastation and attacks on European missionaries, because of course, because this isn't Christian, this isn't really a European inspired revolution. This is taking European ideas to inspire a nationalist revolution. In the same way you can see parallels, some superficial parallels with the boxes later on in the year, 19, in the year 1900. So the British then perform an about term and here you have the reformation of, the, of a new professional supposedly professional Chinese army under the Qing dynasty organized by foreign um, the foreign powers in particular Chinese Gordon and this finally puts an end to the Taiping heavenly kingdom and represents you can say a formalization of what the European powers actually want to do it's not enough to tear China down in order to gain access to these um, uh, potential markets at Britain in particular in the Yangtze River Valley, you also have to have a stable enough social structure existing in China, which can allow for European interference and economic dominance, yet at the same time doesn't result in everyone being killed, as was the case of the Taiping Rebellion. So the Taiping Rebellion is put down, and this leads to a the, the final phase of the Qing Empire. And the Qing respond rather pathetically with this idea of the self-strengthening movement. So it's not enough simply to say that the Chinese didn't do anything and the Japanese were able to successfully adopt Western ideas. If I were going to put this as simply as I can as to why China failed and Japan didn't fail, Japan had a very advanced, close up urbanized, literate population. And they also had a petrified anti-elite who were willing to take power when the political opportunity was given to them. They're called Tozama, or the exiled nobility. Effectively, once you put a, a target on the Bakufu, or the Tokugawa shoguns, you had the emperor, who was the perfect rallying figure, who was out of power, and you had the exiled nobility, and you had an elite, educated population. Every, and of course, you already had an understanding, a familiarity of Western innovations due to the system of Nagasaki and um, uh, Ranganaku, the idea of Western studies. So all of these things compound to give Japan that edge. The reason why this fails in China is because there isn't a real petrified anti-elite. As we saw with the Taiping Rebellion, it's not really there to take power. It's confused, it's sporadic, and it's violent. And it doesn't really have a cohesive source of anti-legitimation. And this is why we see the republicanism becoming such a strong force in China later on, because there isn't a successful Ming counter elite, which is able to successfully take power, which had already existed during the Qing Empire. Instead, you have the bureaucratic system, which is under a Qing aristocracy, who are mainly Manchus and relatives of the emperor. And they are the ones who try to create an environment of reform to preserve the dynasty and to self-strengthen that obviously from the from the idea of the self-strengthening movement the problem is however like i said before 
after Qin Long, there is no powerful emperor. Throughout the entire 19th century, there is no great emperor. And so who takes up this role? It is the second uh, is the second consort or the concubine of the emperor who dies in the 1860s, who later becomes the Grand Empress Dowager Si Qi. She has to take up that role to compensate for a lack of centralized leadership in China. And she does so by ensuring a succession of minority emperors. First, it's her own son, then it's her adopted son, then it's her adopted grandson. So this, if anything, represents the total fragility and you could say the lack of institutional power, which is in the Qing dynasty. And that alone also doesn't account for the fact that China is so much bigger than Japan. We're talking about an empire, which is roughly the same size as the continent, as the entire, not just the continental United States, operating over a system which is basically existed or carried over since the, uh, the medieval era, since the 15th century and hasn't been able to successfully innovate. So what you see in China is these pockets of transformation, which will later come in the international settlements. And the rest of China basically stays the same. In some respects, you can say that's still the case in China. So that's just to bring up a point as to the transformations over the course of the second half of the 19th century, very briefly. Right. And um, the first question that I would like to ask, just to uh, get as much information out of this as possible, um, you know, China, as you mentioned, very big, very populous, has a lot of different regions and um, and uh, local administrations and all this. Um, there was, was it that there was no other counter elite than the ones that tried in Taiping? Or is it that they were incompetent or weren't inspiring enough? You know, uh, it, it was what, simply what was the fact this? that they, they, weren't, they weren't as successful as they, weren't in, as they were in Japan. And when we see the rise of a counter elite, it's far more primitive. So we see it with the Beiyang army officials who later take power in the first phase of the Republic. And we see it in the Republican movement and Sun Yat-sen. They slowly grow and they accumulate power and influence, but they are not this petrified already existing elite who have everything you need effectively to replace a government as what happened in Japan. All you needed was the vision, the decisiveness, and the ability to accept new ideas for the point of strong nation, strong army, which was the mantra of Meiji Restoration Japan. That didn't exist to nearly the same extent um, in China. And just to emphasize this aspect of Manchu domination and why you can say the reaction by the Han majority against the Manchus was so visceral, when the Qing dynasty took over control in the 17th century, everyone in China had to wear the pigtail, which was the traditional um, Manchu hairdress, and they had to shave off the, the their fringe effectively. So everyone wore this status of submission to the new dynasty, and this confirmed the idea that we are creating this institutionalized elite while paying lip service to the old Chinese imperial mechanism. But on top of all of this, we have a group, and you can never aspire to this group because you're not of this ethnicity, which also happens to be a foreign ethnicity at the same time. So all of these things are working against the Qing dynasty, yet they also prevent a, like I said, as existed in Japan, a petrified counter elite, counter elite or a great existent Han aristocracy who are united around a similar goal who can take power all right and the uh one will, i don't think i'll have any more after this because i think it'll just underscore the point perfectly fine um so we do have instances in history where people do take over countries and they weren't necessarily you know sort of like a shadow government already um you know why were the chinese counter at least uh I, I want to say incompetent compared to their Japanese counterparts, but uh, you know, why were they less organized and all this other stuff? Obviously, they didn't have the formality of the uh, you know exiled elites with a with a uh, powerless emperor, all this other stuff that they could just put into power. Um, but surely there was something else they could have done, or is that not the case? Well, they did. I mean, you have individuals like Li Hojing you have a system of viceroys which exists throughout um, China, these these powerful potentates who rule on behalf of the imperial court based in Peking, Beijing. Um, and individually, they have to negotiate and represent the government and they make alliances with foreign powers. 
um, effectively to buttress their position and also to enable a bit of the self-strengthening movement. Ironically, a bit like a poison. You have to let a bit of the West in in order to develop your own personal power base and allow for a moment of technological innovation. Um, as to why this didn't sort of develop into a, a counter elite, like, like I said, I think the situation in Japan is far beyond the norm. The situation in Japan is a perfect example of a counter elite taking power, and it's rare to find in history a moment where there is something as organized and as prepped as it existed in Japan. So rather, I'd say that China represents the norm. And also the norm is in Chinese history that when a new dynasty takes power, it eliminates every vestige of the previous dynasty. Um, all the family members, etc. they're all wiped off the face of the earth and the symbol of the dominance of the new dynasty exists until the mandate of heaven is revoked. Whereas in Japan, the defeated party was, like I said, petrified. It was held in place in exile within the country until such a situation arose where they could take power back. And it's rare to find an instance in history where that exists. But like I said, in China, I, I don't find this an odd phenomena. And you see individual reforming movements. And this is where we get to the next phase, which, which is really wanted to talk about the... Uh, the, the 1890s, etc., where we do see desperate attempts to save the Qing dynasty before we have this, you know, the, the final sort of termination of the dynasty. But as you sort of see with the with the image of Si Chi here, you know, I don't sort of resent Si Chi for what she was trying to do. You know, she many people um accuse Si Chi of, you know, hogging, you know, money, which was supposed to go, for example, to the Department of the Navy or frustrating the reform process. No, she didn't want to uh, frustrate the reform process as much as people would like. However, the fundamental sort of basis of her power was preserving the image of the, of the power of the Qing dynasty. And so all the money and the artistic investment in the apparatus of the court in her new summer palace, say, for example, even images like you see here on the right is a famous painting of Si Chi. All of this is to perpetuate her own power and the power of the Qing court and also the idea of a lasting continuity of Chinese civilization at the same time. These things are of political necessity. These aren't sort of uh, the dying moments. They are, if anything, an overcompensation to reflect the fact it's a dying dynasty. But this is a political necessity, and it is important for her in order to establish her own legitimacy. And you could say this is somewhat successful. I mean, she was known as the old Buddha, basically the uh, the mother of the nation, in the same way that you could say, for example, look at uh, Livia, the wife of Augustus. Right. And uh... As you're saying, it is political necessity. I see a lot of, uh, whenever I read into this, there's always a, uh, I want to call them armchair historians because they don't like read into their profile to see if they're actually you know, qualified to make the statement. But you know, they come out with uh, statements like, well, if I were emperor of China at this time, you would throw money here, 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 and here, and then suddenly the state would be perfectly fine. Um, it completely discounts the fact that if uh, Xi Chi or any of her uh, successors or predecessors were to just um, rapidly modernize, um, especially in the same way that the Japanese did, or even as moderately as some of the other Asian nations, like, uh, say, the Afghans or Thailand or something like that, where, by all accounts, it moved relatively slow. Um, you would have great upheaval and chaos just from the uh, element, the very strong elements of Chinese society that opposed it. Um, you know, you, you would basically lose the mandate of heaven. Well, yes. I mean, if you if you want to spot somebody who doesn't understand uh, history or politics, it's somebody who always says, "Well, just just modernize, just just modernize, bro." You know, like as, as if as if as if that's just some, something you can just do, like turning on a light bulb. You know, um, with 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 anything with anything like that, you will you will usher in enormous social change upheaval and 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 resistance so right and it's worth stating and perhaps am you could go in more to this if it's uh, necessary um you know the army was resistant to modernization which is a very dangerous thing because that is uh if you're looking at this from like some top-down strategic perspective um you, you want your army to be uh capable of dealing with whatever it has to uh which usually means it has to be you know, modernized, whatever that means by the country or the time period. 
Um, the Chinese army at this point in time, if memory serves, was heavily resistant to adopting Western, uh, Western-styled guns, tactics, uh, and thought. And there was only really a few dissident voices within it that led to what little modernization they got. But perhaps uh, that is me being uh, faulty in my mis- er, in my remembering. Well, I mean, I, I think it's. <laughs> I, I tend to sort of shy away from the idea that um, it is simply a case, say, for example, that military officials don't like to learn how to play with new weapons effectively. I, I tend to think it's more of a, um, a, a point of, so, of, of a social rank and social stigma and the idea that inevitably with professional armies, you're wiping out a core element of that social hierarchy and feudalism, and you're facilitating the centralization and the power of the central government, which is not what local officials want to accomplish at all, and is what happens ad nauseum during the warlord era. So uh, this is a point to sort of, not necessarily, I think, go into too much depth now, but just have in the back of our minds as we go forward, because it's going to crop up again and again and again. So when we see reform of the Chinese army, who later become the Beiyang army and the new army, this is, it, it, it is at the same time a reactionary note, but also a revolutionary note at the same time. Um, in the same way that you can see that the, this happens in Latin America, I mean, who deposed of the last Brazilian emperor? Um, it was a radical clique within the army, so both radical and reactionary at the same time, mm. depending on where you are, depending on, uh, and this, Panama, if it's all right, this may be a good time to talk about the international settlements and coming back to the idea of the unequal yes. treaties. Yes. That's fine. So, um, I, I don't think you can really overstate just how much the different Europe or Western powers uh, <laughs> intervened in China, because if I remember correctly, the uh, you know, the surprising thing, statistic that I, I would usually pull out is like, a, you know, at, at the end of the uh, of the uh, Chinese uh, emperorship, monarchy, kingdom, whatever you want to call it, you know, um, you know, Austria, Hungary had multiple blocks of Beijing that it effectively controlled, you know, a, uh, an Jin empire Jin, not, yeah. yeah, an empire not known for its overseas holdings got in on sort of the scramble for China uh, to uh, appropriate a term. So um, where would you like to start? Because we've talked a little bit about the British holdings um, and opium wars there. Um, France would quite famously get its own ports out of its uh, interventions in the opium wars uh, or their own interventions. I think they're known by another name in France, but um, Russia would take outer Manchuria and uh, eventually, uh, would it be Dailan? which would then be taken by the Japanese later. Uh, so where do we need to start, you two? Panama, do you want to start? Um, I mean, I was, I would defer to you, I would think. Um, and, I, you know, just because, of, just because of how we do things, we don't necessarily need to, if we just pick one, we don't need to uh, talk about its extreme importance later on in the story it could just be showcasing what it was like there well i mean we've we've dealt with um um the dowager empress and events in the 1800s would it would it be good to um just lead up with the con the, well i mean i guess we sort of covered the conventions could we talk about the boxes maybe well, well, the um, idea, sorry, the idea of Panama is why I want to bring this up, is that this all leads onto the boxes. Um, I see, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's just a matter, so, so uh, just to bring this up, okay, right. The British along, we've already mentioned the Portuguese, but they're not really relevant to uh, well, this conversation. I was going to uh, bring up, you did have the ideas of, uh, so you had the uh, Deja European ports, right, that would, uh, you know, this European country would directly own this city or port or whatnot. Uh, yes. But you also had spheres of influence that would lead to um, what we're about to talk about. Should would that be uh, I, a good place? If, if that's to... possible, uh, I'll, I'll just stay that until we get to the the, the first Japanese war because it sort of okay. lends onto the open door policy, which you probably know a lot more about than I do. <laughs> um, but so the first we we talked about Macau, talked about Hong Kong. The next sort of major economic sphere, which also explains a lot of Ch uh, Chinese history going forward, is the central importance of Shanghai. Shanghai is a coastal area, but it sits near the mouth of the 
uh, Yangtze River Valley. It's also a good strategic location in the sense that it is basically the midpoint along the Chinese coast. So controlling that point exerts a huge amount of power throughout all of China, throughout the Delta, but also throughout all of Asia. By consequence, if you're looking at the Pacific, you're looking at Korea and you're looking at Japan. And so this in the 1840s became very attractive to the British, the Americans and the French. And this ultimately these concessions amalgamated into these international settlements or legation quarters. So you have such a quarter in Shanghai, with which is effectively completely independent from China, even though they are held by these treaties. They have their own economic systems. Architecturally, they're completely different. They're inhabited by a Western elite. They have their own legal systems, their own Supreme Courts. Um, and this is consolidated after the Second Opium War, so in the 1860s. And as these major hubs of international influence and control are established, it just sort of expands from there. So Britain establishes a, a series of uh, control points throughout all of the coast. Uh, we have Tianjin, Tianjin, which is basically the uh, the closest port to Beijing in the north, because Beijing isn't a port city, it is an inland city. Um, in the 19th century is referred to as Tianjin. When we have the unification of Germany, Germany also appears to become a major, um, not necessarily a major, I'm exaggerating, um, a significant, if yeah. not major, imperial power. And they also establish a quarter in Tianjin. Um, uh, but also, it's not just the international concessions who mentioned Russia. Russia has annexed a large portion of China in outer Manchuria. Right. And this later becomes Vladivostok. Vladivostok literally means ruler of the East in Russian. So as to emphasize the significance that Alexander II is placing on Russian control of a continuous empire, which is now going to expand. And this I really need to emphasize. I think you can almost see that Manchuria itself, not just outer Manchuria, and uh, uh, Dalian and Port Arthur represents the logic of Russian expansion in the East in order to establish a major power in the Pacific, other than Vladivostok, which is almost like a token power in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So Russia, you can say, almost has a, um, a, a direct sort of manifest destiny to acquire this territory and to set up control of Manchuria, of Xinjiang, of Mongolia, etc. France, in competition with Britain, is expanding into one of the few untapped areas in the Far East, which is Indochina. So they establish control over Saigon, and from there they take over Vietnam, they take over Cambodia, they take over Laos, and now they have a land border with Yunnan and Guangxi and the southern area of China. Now, all of a sudden, out of left field, we have Japan. Right. Japan. And, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That sort of uh, French expeditions into Vietnam and Cambodia uh, is quite the story, uh, which we probably will not be covering in great detail here. Um, so by all means, go look into that. Yeah, yeah, eventually, perhaps. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you terribly much. I just figured uh, that that's one of my more um, interesting parts of history that oftentimes gets looked over as the expeditions into there. But anyways. Uh, oh, no, sure. Um, so out, out of nowhere, Japan goes from being a, again, a potentially conquered power uh, like China, but on a smaller scale, and it successfully adapts. And it probably correctly assumes that the only way that China, sorry, Japan is able to retain its sovereignty is by becoming a great power of a European rank. And so they adopt the same posture and the same policies as a European power. First, they consolidate and centralize control and administration of the home islands. The four main islands are Honshu, Shikuku, Hokkaido, and, and uh, Kyushu. And then it begins to expand into um, the Ryukyu Islands, which is Okinawa. And they also expand their interests in Korea and gain um, concessions only after a, a fundamental point, which is the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, the sort of reasons as for why the war happened aren't really important. And as much as regarding that this is, China has not only been defeated by a European power, China has now been defeated from a weaker Asian power at the same time, significant, you know, decisively defeated. 
And this is, you could say, a perfect demonstration in 1894 to 1895 as to Japan successfully modernizing and China unsuccessfully modernizing. And as a result of this, Japan gains her own international concessions in China and annexes Taiwan as well. If I could just add a couple of things here. Um, the Russian expansion into, at first, outer Manchuria and then sort of a eyeing, you know, inner Manchuria, uh, both informally, basically immediately after they got their concessions, and then explicitly uh, where they start having uh, different military engagements, railroad buildings, and whatnot else. Um, that plays into Russian strategy quite a lot, and I don't really see that talked about nearly as much, because that is uh, this area right up here is the you know ancestral homelands of the uh, emperors of China at this point in time. So if you take that and subjugate it, that is quite the blow, uh, regardless of any strategic importance there, to the power that you are invading. Well, I, I mean, this is a two-pronged attack because it used right. to it, it used to be um, just a, essentially a settled nation of the Manchus within China. And all of a sudden now you're having immigration from the rest of China as well. So you're already diluting the fact that this is a special homeland for the Manchurian people. And I very much see that this is a response to Russian expansion because it's far easier to control an area which is sparsely populated as opposed to a territory which has all of these established urban centers, which are now going to be far more difficult to conquer. And so the Russians, expand into central Manchuria indirectly, as opposed to outer Manchuria, where they simply directly annex the region right. in response, uh, Chinese in response to an ultimatum. And this is this sort of sets up the powder keg in Korea, because Japan is expanding into the same region, Russia is expanding into the same region, Korea is effectively the no man's land between Russia interest in Manchuria and Japanese, you could say, their own sort of existential interests because Korea was described by Japanese at the time as basically the, the dagger aimed at the heart. If you control Korea, you have a base with which to invade Japan and reignite the situation of the unequal treaties, what happened with Commodore Perry in the 1850s. I would say that Russia handled this incompetently, and uh, it doesn't really matter again getting into that fact, but all of a sudden, Japan is ascendant in Korea, Russia is defeated in Manchuria, and Japan establishes that control where Russia was previously ascendant. And for Russia, this is, uh, it's interesting that you bring this up, that this isn't actually me often mentioned. More than the fact that this is simply Russia being defeated by an Asian power, it mm -hmm. is the territory which is so important. Like I said, if Russia had been able to annex core Manchuria and establish a a, a real um, naval presence on that side of the uh, that side of the Chinese Sea, then Russia would be able to establish a far greater presence in the Pacific theater and in Asia right. compared to what it has now. And this defeat from China uh, represented the you can say the great check within one of these last untapped areas of potential for Russian expansion. And as a result, I would say it was one of the most significant and greatest defeats of Russia in its entire history, possibly even greater than um, that of the, the, the Great Patriotic War from 1941 to 1945, because Russia was able to recoup that defeat in a way it wasn't able to compensate for this defeat in the East. Um, right. And if you, uh, just to underscore all of that, if you look at a uh what Russia has in the purple without Manchuria over here, or uh, the pink rather. Um, you know, Russia can, you know, project on sort of these waters and going farther outward to the, uh, to the uh, west, or the east rather. Um, just with the uh, amount of uh, investment that Russia has in her navy, doesn't usually ever really focus on southward, from, to my understanding. It was always just kind of securing this, uh, these coastlines. If you have this port right in here, suddenly you have this entire area open to the Russian Navy. Uh, you can easily sail around Korea um, with and, Russian and interests. So, exactly. And so why do you think Britain formed an alliance with Japan in 1902 to prevent this exact thing happening? Right. Um, right also, because you have all the European uh, possessions down to the south here. If all, Russia can all project. All of threatened, yes. Because Russia, Russia can project a continuous land force in China, which none of the European powers can match. Yeah. If I'm not wrong, doesn't the port of Vladivostok freeze over in the winter as well? 
Yes. Yeah, so it's the idea of getting a summer port in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So you have that problem. The, uh, yeah, the, the continuous problem of, of Russian uh, hu hunting for a warm water port with not much <laughs> success. Yeah. Right. Um, so with that cultural influence, though, that you were mentioning, sort of uh, de facto, you know, they didn't own Manchuria for the vast majority of all of this. They only briefly owned it in the southern portion, if I remember correctly, for railroad purposes. Um, it would be sort of the heavily influenced uh, city of Harbin that would... Uh, you know, the Russians would basically, it would be Russian investment, immigrants, uh, culture that would influence that city. And then later it would come to house the uh, remnants of the Russian White Army after their defeat, which you can kind of, you could probably make some sort of poetic irony there if you wanted to. Yes, the the first sort of major defeat is the the, the source of the last lingering elements of Imperial Russia. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think as for, because this is just a like trying to explain China within a broader right. sort of geo, 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 geopolitical uh, context but regarding what's actually happening in China itself because China seems like a very passive actor within this and to some extent you'll be correct and that that's not a feeling lost on the Chinese themselves in 1898 there is this attempt by the Emperor of China the actual Emperor of China not Xi Qi to arrest control over his government and try and replicate the success in Japan with the Meiji Restoration um, like I said, Xi Qi is able to retain control through these, this idea of a perpetual minority empire. So long as you have child emperors, then you're always the regent in perpetuity. When her own son dies in 1876, it was rumored at the time that she poisoned her own son. I don't believe it's true, but it was a prevalent feeling at that time. So I find that interesting because that's the story that I always heard just sort of like it was established fact was that she would just murder the children whenever they would yes. almost reach age. so She almost certainly did that with Guangxu. Um, less, to a lesser extent, that's possible with uh, Tong Ji, uh, who was her own son. But Guangxu was her adopted son. And she was able to rule relatively well for the first 20 years of his life. And then when it's obvious that he's reached his majority in 1898, he attempts to gain control over the government and steers through this reform package, which would have made attempted to make China into a constitutional monarchy with his own parliament. And again, this is implicit association with many of the Chinese revolutionaries that democratization equals innovation. Um, which is something that the Japanese adopt superficially and then challenge to to a great effect throughout the course of the 20th century. Um, this effort fails. Xi Qi, uh, with the backing of many conservative potentates and the majority of the army, takes back control over the government, places her adopted son under house arrest, and he'll later be murdered on her own deathbed 10 years later. So, all right, that is... I hadn't quite heard it from necessarily that perspective. Like, I think yeah. even if I were to find my history book, it probably would just say in a paragraph, you know, the Empress Dowager would murder her well, emperors to make sure that she could stay the regent. I was I was going to probe a little bit more because I've yes, okay, most, go on. pretty much all of the hit all the history or historiography I find on the Empress is basically either decrying her as this sort of sort of ultra reactionary tyrant to the point of to the point of kind of self weakening stupidity or they seem to be kind of slightly feministic takes where they talk about her as a kind of great female leader um, yeah you basically well, that, that, <laughs> to be to be to, to be clear this isn't my own view this is simply what happens but regarding actually sort of what politically happens in between there and i haven't sort of got into forgive me, it's, forgive it's me. Not, if, if i if i if i misheard you but earlier you you said that um you or you seem to imply that you would um you thought that she she took the right course of action um in the position she was in um, yes, and I, I, I still believe that. And I can still you, believe that. Can you expound on that a little bit more, just because it interests me? I'm not saying I necessarily disagree. I don't really, I don't really have the knowledge in, in depth enough to do that. But um. well, yes. I, I, well, at this time during the 103 days reform, uh, Guangxu was essentially receiving a lot of support from uh, quite a few sort of radical Chinese um, monarchical theorists. A lot of them have been shunted to the side uh, by. Uh, Empress Yi Qi. So the idea essentially is 
with, with a lot of the the higher ranking sort of potentates of the Qing Empire, in particular uh, uh, Li Ho Zheng and uh, Zheng Jingdong, is this idea of controlled modernization. This idea that yes, we create a powerful navy, we create a powerful army, we create a competent uh, bureaucratic administration, but we don't let the entire social order of China collapse underneath us. And this is very much demonstrated by what Xi Qi, what happens with Xi Qi over the next 10 years. Because superficially, yes, you can say 1898 is some sort of reactionary coup by someone who is desperate just to hold on to power, whatever the cost. However, two years later, we have the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxers were this, for lack of a better word, xenophobic group who were yes. responding to what seemed like total national humiliation and foreign control. Remember, this is only five years after China had lost the Sino-Japanese War. So this also should emphasize what Xi Xi is doing. When we see a radical, fast reform movement only three years after such a national catastrophe, it is also seen by many moderate reformers that this is too much too fast and will collapse the system in so reforming. So there is, again, a logical impetus, you can say, trying to arrest this process. And th there's no sort of way I can get around it. Xi Xi was determined to rule by permanent regencies. There's no getting about that. Mm -hmm. It's determining whether she was right to do so. So we have the we have the boxes. We have the sense of national humiliation. We have America stepping in with its open door policy, saying we are not going to let what happened to Africa a decade before happen to China. We are simply going to have formal Russian annexation of Manchuria. The the French are going to annex Yunnan. The British are going to annex Shanghai and the surrounding areas, and there will be a great partition. And that was very much the feeling of this time. And of course, this was a feeling of Xi Xi herself. So the boxes. Can, uh, can I just ask that? I mean realistically how feasible was that though because i mean we're, when we're talking about china i mean I, I don't think that you know yunnan and manchuria and shanghai are really comparable to regions of africa you know both in that terms of basically in, uninhabited <laughs> yeah i mean you're talking in terms of infrastructure in terms of population in terms of active resistance i mean how i it doesn't really sound like a feasible idea this idea that you, the european powers could just partition um the, 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 the Chinese like that. Well, yes, the, the idea of partition is, again, it's this idea of defining clear spheres of influence, definitive okay. spheres of influence. So they where, move on for this model of, of indirect rule, essentially. Where no, where no other power can effectively operate. Okay. Um, and the idea, again, of the American open door policy is to secure American interests effectively by allowing unfettered access throughout the entire country. Before we uh, go on directly to the open door and all that, I did have a couple of things I was wanting to add to the uh, sort of systems that we are laying out here with the spheres of influence and all. Um, and I do have something that might sound very counterintuitive for who we are, uh, this panel, uh, to begin with. Um, I do think there is a case to be made that democratization would lead to extensive modernization in these countries just because uh, with all the terrible things that come along with it, that would break the power structures, assuming that you got what you wanted explicitly and then compromise anything, which is unrealistic. But in theory, you would break the power structures and the uh, people that would want to modernize would now have control over things they previously didn't. Uh, would that not essentially be the well, logic of the people pushing for it? My my immediate thought there is that, well, no, because as AM said, the, the counter elite is not that organized. They're not that they're not as single minded as they were in a place like Japan. So right, exactly but... what what modernization you want is different. And also um, democratization, I think, um, using what knowledge I have of, of the time, and also looking at what happened with further attempts at re republicanism in the next hundred years, it would, you would essentially, the power would still be in the hands of kind of uh, landowners and those kinds of elites all, all over the country, I think. Um, right, but you would be shifting power from the sort of feudal landowners to the, uh, you know, growing merchant class, wouldn't you? Yes, but when you're talking about this, where are you talking about this? You're mm. talking about the big cities, you're talking about the coastline. If right. you establish that, you would just have 
these basically city-state remnants across the coast which have greatest proximity to the west and then the rest of china will just dissolve into absolute chaos and fragment uh, okay. well, yes There's this this is the thing as well is is remember the sheer scale of china you know trying to turn that into even a limited sort of um plural or democratic idea um is going to be nigh on impossible yes we're talking I mean, about right, right. Never happened. <laughs> we're talking about 19th century democracy in terms of empowering a bourgeoisie we're not we're not talking about mao's peasant rebellion yet. yes yeah. right and i wasn't bringing that point up to say that i just really love democracy i was more just saying like i can see a logic to the fact that if you were to have that system it would hasten modernization just because you remove or you weaken a lot of the interests that would be against it not that it would be good or desirable, yeah, yes, but, but for, the, for the point of view of the, of the Chinese nationalists again, if you empower this uh, middle class elite, all they're going to do is again almost become the puppets of Westernization. So it takes yeah. a huge Herculean effort, as we will see with Sun Yat Sen, to try and overcompensate for that. But ironically, you bring up this idea of democratization. In many senses, the Boxer Rebellion at first is a movement from below, which is then capitalized and exploited by right. Xi Qi. And this is where I think, again, you have to Dis it displays her political acumen because at first she perceives it as a nuisance which could overly complicate her role with the foreign powers and so she originally opposes it but as it gains momentum and it actually seems successful in attacking various consulates and killing foreigners she thinks actually no this can represent some possible ally in my future quest to effectively assume sovereignty proper over china and so she then tentatively supports it. When she begins to support it, how do the Western powers react? Do they just you know, go away and abandon their concessions in uh, China and give up all their treaty ports and unequal treaties? No, they initiate an eight power coalition force to rescue uh, the besieged uh, legations <clears throat> in, in uh, Beijing and reassume control over the country so no the western powers aren't just going to run away meekly <laughs> right so um and i'm out of like the 60 something people that are watching right now uh before we move directly on to the box rebellion directly in discussion i'm surprised no one made the joke of uh Cixi being the uh being the ideal feminist leader like you basically usurp the emperorship of one of the most powerful countries on earth by having multiple post-birth abortions and uh being the ultimate girl boss emperor like there are historians that argue that you can you can <laughs> you, if, you, if i if i went to the history section at the nearest waterstones to me yeah. there would be several there are in fact i know there are several books arguing the feminist case essentially for the empress um, yeah but I'm, I'm surprised no one in chat sort of like you know threw out the jokes there but maybe um, yeah so we probably should talk about the um, open door policy um, and all this other stuff, sort of like what are the intentions of the uh, up and coming Americans as opposed to the uh, as opposed to the other imperial powers, because you were mentioning there was sort of like a fear that people would quite insanely partition uh, Qing China. Um, it is worth saying at this point in time, um, America, for a variety of reasons, could not get involved on and in, into the uh, you know, the various uh, imperialistic measures that you see in a lot of other uh, uh, Western powers. Um, you have opposition at home uh, that would uh, point to the very foundation of the United States should not be on imperialism. Therefore, we should stay basically inside the borders that we got from Mexico. Um, you would have only tacit support from the people that did support uh, um, outside interventions. So they would not at all be okay with partitioning countries or taking ports directly. They would be uh, satisfied with the indirect power. Well, the irony um, being that uh, America was one of the most aggressive powers in this region oh, during the 1850s and 60s. Oh, yeah. And whenever you do have, uh, say, Commodore Perry uh, sent to Japan to you know open up the markets and put it into our sphere of influence and whatnot to save it from the European powers, uh, you know, as it was presented, um, there was a lot of blowback basically back home of people saying, you know, we're about to d devolve into, uh, you know, multiple internal strifes here. Um, why are we focusing on Japan? 
uh, did not play well with basically anyone back here. We have a civil war which prevents us from intervening in the uh, more aggressive parts of intervention in Qing China. So basically when the Russians um, invade Manchuria, um, when various other powers start to uh, get involved rather than just France and Britain, um, uh, or at least directly rather, um, you know, America's a bit busy back home, and then you basically have us capped out for a good decade or so afterwards because we're recovering from a civil war, um, and which is also one of the most impoverished times in U.S. history, self-inflicted, I might add. Um, so America's out for most of this. We missed the jump, if you will, uh, if we were to be an imperial power. Um, and by the time that we're finally able to look uh, westward across the Pacific, um, Japan has gone off and sort of tried to uh, free itself from a uh, from an explicitly American uh, sphere of influence. Um, which well, is well, uh, well, it wouldn't have been at that. I mean, you're correct that the American Civil War for that specific policy couldn't have happened at a worse time because right. the Meiji Restoration was in 1868. But um, yeah, at, at the time, it would have basically it was a competition between the British and the French over who would be the predominant influence in Japan. And of course, as we see, the Japanese are able to surpass both of them in terms of right. their, and of course, actually play a significant role within the makeup of this unequal treaty system within China itself. And it's worth noting the specific goal with trying to open up Japan and all the other stuff with uh, Commodore Perry wasn't necessarily to like equalize the field or make it to where we can just make more money. There is a political interest that we could have a very uh, subservient Japanese ally in the Far East. Um, so they could basically do what they wanted to. They could basically act as an American uh, representative there. Um, but with the collapse of the American domestic government um, in 1861, uh, all of those ideas go out the window. Um, Japan has its own movements uh, for modernization, self-strengthening, and uh, breaking out of isolationism, which was what made it uh, feasible to have a subservient Japanese ally. Um, so any hopes of that are dashed after America is looking back sort of extraterritorially. And, you know, you're looking at China from the perspective of the Americans. All the Europeans are already in there. What do you do if you want to get in on this? Um, you basically stop them and just tell everyone, we're going to play the peacemakers now. And, uh, you know, all of China is going to be open to everybody. We don't need to divide people up. That's barbaric and uh, warlike. If we all just trade in the sort of this Chinese economic zone, we can even divide it up informally with uh, who governs where, who has the majority trade rights in these regions. But so long as we don't partition, mm. then everyone will be better off. And because be that's the more, only way America can get influence uh, now. And to be even more cynical than that, uh, who was president at the time? William McKinley. And <laughs> right. what, what, what had just happened? The uh, the American Spanish War. You know, I, I the was Americans, about to bring that up. Yes. The Americans in Guam, the Americans in the Philippines. Right. So all of a sudden, China is that much more central to American interests. And they have gained in the Philippines what they failed to achieve in Japan. The US, and, US imperialism in full swing here. And I, I, I will, of course. Uh, I can't can't help but mention the teaser for the the ever upcoming Spain series where the yes. seizure of uh, the Philippines and Guam and Cuba will play an enormous role in, right. uh, in the future of Spain. And if you wanted to be even even more cynical, um, who were McKinley's uh, backers? You know, what was McKinley's power base in the U.S.? Do either of you two know? It was the well, he had the, he had the press on side, didn't he? Well, he, he had the press, but he also had another group that would benefit quite greatly from increasing American reach into foreign markets. Do you know what it would be? I mean, it wouldn't be a certain ethnicity, would it? Well, not necessarily. He was seen as sort of the darling of the American industrialists. I see. Rockefeller, Morgan, right. Carnegie, um, any of the others. Uh, the the liberal uh, historiography in the U.S. basically goes that... Uh, he was bought off by them, and they put Roosevelt. They they themselves put Roosevelt in the vice presidency to make sure he couldn't get to them and all this other stuff. Um, not entirely off the mark, like some other uh, narratives go, but um, these are people that if you could sell to one of the largest populations on the earth, um, you know, oil, uh, steel, uh, electricity, you know, all these other things. Uh, if you could basically have what just happened in America where everyone is willing to buy all this because it's the great new thing and it, it's 
the biggest increase in quality of life since uh, probably the first industrial revolution. Um, there's a lot of money to be made there. Uh, and just so happens that the president we have not only has the media on side, so he can he can basically act with impunity in foreign policy so long as it's within those interests. Um, his power base is the people that would benefit the most from increased uh um, economic intervention into other countries. So something to throw out there. That's the, uh, mm. that's the very cynical take here. <laughs> um, I will say though, there was probably less provided the system didn't end in revolution, which I don't think was the intent or the expectation for most of these countries. Um, th there is credit here that it probably was the least amount of bloodshed you could have if you just told people not to invade and just everyone can trade in these regions um, well, what, perhaps what, you guys what, have a different view well i mean i i've always sort of looked at the the boer war as one of the great turning points in terms of this phase of new imperialism when you look at when you're looking at the um partition of africa the, the, the great scramble for africa um you have to sort of view this within the ideas of formally delineating great power influence rather than simply you know we just want to conquer the interior because we have this, you know, great xenophobic desire to, you know, civilize the natives, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, there were some people who thought that way, but the overriding political um, impetus for it was we don't want a war between Britain and France. So we need to draw exactly where the boundaries are, even if we don't actually exert formal control over these lands. Um, and that would have been similar in China. However, what existed in China, what didn't exist in Africa, was a legitimate government which could, in theory, um, control the interior. Well, as we see, not really. And with the Boxer rebellions, um, that idea was seriously put to the test. And again, to reverse this idea that Xi Xi was just, um, you could say, the greatest enemy of China during this point, um, again, on the back of this another humiliation among all of these collective humiliations. Um, we have the idea of a constitutional outline, or the they're sometimes sort of summarized as the, the late Qing reforms, where you have more conservative ministers, along with Yuan Shikai, who is one of the great sort of potentates of the new Chinese army, coming in to make these tentative reforms to the Chinese political system, such as banning the imperial examinations. One of the reasons why the imperial examinations were so criticized is they were based on a proficiency with the Confucian texts, yes. rather than you can say any modern notion of political science, whatever that would be. Um, so the idea was replacing a traditional Chinese bureaucracy with a modern Western style bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. But of course, the, the traditional sort of historiography is that this was too little too late and that the Qing Empire's fall was inevitable. My view isn't that. My view is that we finally have two counter elites who are prepped but not dominant in the 20th century and that when the fall of the Qing dynasty happened it was accidental not, not planned um, and these two elites are the republican movement under Sun Yat-sen and the army under Yuan Shikai um, so as we mentioned the army is not like the collective sort of uniform unit. We, we're talking about local decentralized militias and powers and a modern army with relatively modern weapons and uh, modern Western training, which is also far more revolutionary than the Chinese militias. When we're going to um, Sun Yat-sen, uh, I believe Sun yat again, I'm just trying to memorize this. I haven't studied this in so long. Uh, Sun Yat-sen uh, was a doctor and his main sort of inspiration was looking at Hong Kong and believing that Hong Kong represented a microcosm, the sort of orderly constitutional democratic society, which should be introduced throughout the entirety of China. Um, so would it be would it also be worth pointing out that he, I believe, went to medical school in Hawaii, um, if I'm, I'm not wrong, it, 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 and even traveled if... in America? Even if that's not necessarily the case, it is worth pointing out he has a lot of connections to Hawaii because that's going to be what allows mm. him to escape persecution. I, mean, I, but, I, I believe he, he became a Christian, didn't he, in his early days? If I'm that I correctly. don't know. So, Possibly, I can't remember. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I think I figured I would just <laughs> uh, interject there, just because there is a uh, there's a lot of connections between Yatsen and Hawaii, basically from the beginning. Yes. Anyway, sorry, I ended up going. Oh, uh, no, I, I, that's a weird sort of um, 
point of entry, isn't it? Because this isn't even Hawaii, the American territory, let alone the American state. This is the oh, yeah, Polynesian no. Kingdom of Hawaii. It's an interesting sort of connection there. Uh, but uh, it, it is in Honolulu that he, I believe, finally sort of learns how to speak English, um, where he studies English and he studies you know, Western science. So in many senses, he, and also I do believe he did talk, uh, he was friends with a, uh, a Christian missionary. Um, again, I'm trying to trying to remember this. John um, G. Kerr is the one you're yes, talking about. Yes, John yeah. G. Kerr. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm just looking at an article here and it says that he did receive a Christian baptism. So we're talking about a Western educated man who learned to speak English and was um, and was baptized having been brought up in Honolulu and Hawaii. He's not exactly your standard, uh, bog standard uh, setup for this great uh, Chinese uh, nationalist uh, hero. And of course, he spends the next decade or so in exile and failing to ferment uh, Republican uprisings in China. And of course, after the uh, Sino-Japanese War, uh, he spends a long time in Japan, trying to raise international support for reform within China. And as we've seen, uh, there is a logical reason, even after the Boxer Rebellion, as to why the Americans and the British wouldn't want wholesale uh, constitutional experimentation in China, which is sponsored by the West, in the sense that they're worried about the incredibly delicate balance of power and inviting full-scale anarchy. And this is a constant point we come back to throughout the entire course of the 20th century, retaining a social and political structure which is stable enough to ensure the continuity of the unequal treaties and the viability of the international settlements and the trade agreements. So from this unpromising, unexpected source in Sun Yat-sen, the, the very much the, the international agitator for this novel system of republicanism in Chinese history, um, we have the Xinhai revolution. And my, my view of the Xinhai revolution, it begins with a, uh, a mutiny mm -hmm. in Wunchang. Well, uh, which... um, before we get too terribly far into it, it's worth saying this is uh, it's either like the second or the third attempt for a Chinese Republican revolution after the Boxer Rebellion, if I remember correctly. I, I believe it's, it's actually many more. Um, oh, okay. there's, so... there's quite a number of minor revolts and mutinies and uprisings. I well, I, I, in the particular story of Sun Yat-sen, I remember he had tried multiple times previously <clears throat> to get the Chinese to uh, uh, adopt Republican ideals by force, basically, uh, and failed and then had to flee to Hawaii uh, after having been to Hawaii multiple times beforehand. But mm -hmm. um, I figured I should at least say that this is, a, uh, this is something that he had been working towards for a large portion of his life. Yes, and then and, uh, at this point in time, I don't think he was even there to ignite it. Like, I no, think he came uh, well, in later. Well, no, this is why I, 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 I don't give Sun Yat-sen credit and explains a lot of what happens later. Uh, but he's also trying to get support from the Chinese international community in Singapore. So again, Singapore, Hong Kong, British influence, you know, Japan, American societies. And I, I think it's just better to look at sort of 1895 after the first, you know, the great humiliation towards Japan to 1911 as just a sporadic series of revolutionary activity rather than set rebellions or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But there were many, um, many different uprisings, all of which failed. And as you correctly say, when the Wuchang uprising does happen, it's not inspired by him, even though he does have his own uh, secret society, um, which is based on his, you know, three principles of the people, just to bring that up so I don't forget, uh, Minzu, or nationalism, uh, Minkuan, uh, democracy, and Minsheng, which means welfare. And of course, these are all rather nebulous concepts and open to constant revision, as we'll see with the fate of the nationalist uh, Kuomintang. Deliberately movement. quite vague, I think. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, you you build a broad tent, you build a big tent, yet at the mm -hmm. same time, this is just open to infinite levels of uh, subversion from the left and the right. But my view of the my view of the Xinhai uh, Xinhai revolution was it was a it was a, a military mutiny for, based on completely unrelated reasons that ballooned into a general uprising of the army. And this is also after the death of uh, Xi Xi. She dies in 1908. And she, again, trying to continue her particular form of government, her arranged um, consort to Emperor Guangzhou was uh, uh, Empress Lingyuan, 
um, she was going to continue this system under a new proclaimed emperor, Puyi, uh, who was, who, how old was he? Three years old at the time he was made emperor. Real. Right, um, yeah, he was a toddler. Yes. So this was going to continue supposedly throughout the course of a, of a new sort of regency period and, a, and another minority reign. Um, but it really meant that, and with the death of uh, Li Ho Zheng and um, uh, Zhang Zhidong, and you can say the passiveness of the Manchurian aristocracy, um, real power in the country was under Yuan Shikai. So once you see this military revolution um, from you know, mutiny, it's easy to say from Wu Chang, the Manchurian elite, who are incredibly weak, and have virtually no legitimacy in a country which is becoming increasingly hand-centric and nationalistic, um, is simply concerned with protecting their own property and their own status. And so we see the, the, the remarkable settlement where Yuan Shikai basically concludes the creation of the Republic of China is to allow Puyi and the imperial court to retain, with all expenses paid in the forbidden city, to exist as a court as if nothing had ever happened. <laughs> well, the executive control of the country formally passes from the Qing dynasty to a puppet government under Sun Yat-sen, which is really controlled by Yuan Shikai. And, and that's your, uh, that's your, you know, toddler emperor of all China. Last there. emperor of the Qing dynasty, yeah. yeah. Who has a very interesting life in and of himself, actually. That would be a good a good stream for another day. I, I was about to say, you and I could cover that eventually. Yes. Uh, it would be much less comprehensive than what we're doing here. So From be... from Emperor to Gardener, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Civil sorry, servant. Yes. So, anyway, sorry. Well, that that's all there really is to say. I mean, we have... Um... We have a Manchurian elite preserved within the palace, though not in the country. We have someone who's referred to as emperor within the imperial city, it's yet not strange. without it. We have a provisional president who is the nominal head of the Republican movement who has absolutely no power. And then you have real power being vested by Yuan Shikai and the reformed clique of the advanced section of the Chinese military or the Beiyang army. And very quickly, um, the, the pretense of the provisional government is removed. There is a coup within a coup. Uh, I believe Sun Yat-sen is forced out of the country to Japan again. And the Beiyang army just simply formalizes the role and makes Yuan Shikai president. Right. Yeah, so um, during the, that period of uh, army modernization that we talked about earlier, um, you would have regional military schools that were set up, military academies. Mm. And uh, most of their soldiers' loyalty will be uh, tied to whoever was the commander or the leader of those military academies. Uh, this will be important later whenever we talk about warlords and all of that. But um, you know, all of these all of these guys in the new army knew each other basically at the uh, upper level. Um, they were all sort of would have been displaced under the old system, so they, their loyalty isn't really with the old empire. And um, yes, they're they're in increasingly fairly radical right. um and i unless i'm wrong a lot of the cadets at this time or people who graduated from the academies would 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 go on to form part of the kuomintang uh, well yeah later. and parts of them would and then there were the other parts here like we see with the Beiyang army um where they their loyalty was more just tied to each other um you could yeah, really kind of liken it to yeah, traditional despotism, mm -hmm. uh, which is why Sun Yat-sen basically gets expelled because he is advocating for something much more ideological with, um, obviously he would be the leader because he's the one articulating it, not because he's just crowning himself, you know, emperor of China. Yes, yes, but to be, to be more cynical though, I mean, why was he made provisional president in the first place? It was to yeah. give this a veneer right. of legitimacy and a, and a veneer of innovation rather than right. simply... Yes, rather than the replacement of a of a legitimate emperor of, Ch of an empire of China to be replaced by a military clique, um, which effectively is what really happened. But of course, as we see, Sun Yat-sen has no intention of being a puppet. He actually wants to reform China and rule as an executive president. And this is at odds with the Beiyang army, who for the most part are 
apolitical. Like you say, it's it's important to understand this is almost a military oligarchy and not Yuan Shikai as a even a despot, but rather Yuan Shikai as a primus into Paris, a first among equals. He's basically like the uh, the godfather of the Beiyang army, but he's not its dictator. And this right. explains why when the new system is because this really has to be seen as almost like an enduring provisional system of government no one really knows what to do now that the Qing dynasty has been swept aside because their own status is confirmed their own property is confirmed and there's no attempt the, 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 there was one brief attempt um, a couple of years later to restore lasted the Qing Empire days. lasted for 12 days but apart from that it's not really feasible to look to the Qing emperors as some real source of legitimacy because of their the ethnic considerations revolving around them so the question is how do we create a new enduring system and what are the sort of western powers going to be amenable towards well the solution obviously is to make Yuan Shikai the emperor of China. And yes. what's very interesting is that that this whole operation fails very quickly. Um, he's not quite spectacularly, quite spectacularly. <laughs> and he dies, uh, he dies soon after. So uh, why why did this happen? Because Yuan Shikai, uh, he was a great ambitious potentate, and he seemed content to simply control the the Chinese Empire rather than directly rule it or even assume the imperial dignity. Um, there are some personal reasons as to why he finally took over the empire, given the fact that his son wanted to become emperor after him. Um, but I think the more serious notion is, again, that Japan, sorry, China, Sun Yat-sen's reform program relied on a a root, a, a, a complete sort of fu fundamental rewrite of Chinese history. Even right. the idea of a, a Ming Kuo or a people's state, which Sun Yat-sen wanted to create. Um, so rather than rely on this, because Yuan Shikai wasn't a revolutionary, he was an opportunist. The idea instead was relying on something which was more organic, you could say, to the China that existed at the time and something that would be amenable to foreign powers and something that had already been achieved in Japan, which was creating a modern monarchy. But the reason, again, I believe this failed is because China and his situation wasn't that of a despot. It was that of a primus into Paris. And the Beiyang army had no interest in basically falling in line behind a legitimate and unquestioned sovereign, as opposed to one of them who they could simply reselect from among their own ranks. So you could say that this also informs part of a potential succession struggle rather than a potential sort of a uh, system of power they didn't want they wanted power to pass between themselves rather than one of yuan chikai's own family um so right. it's rather cynical in every sort of in every single aspect you can look at this it's dripping with cynicism and uh, obviously it fails and after yuan chikai dies we see a protracted period of political instability uh really from Nine, oh, really from the beginning, from 1912 all the way up until the Northern Expedition in 1928. And the sort of major thing we see during that time is China's entry into the First World War and the student uprising during it. Um, I don't know how much you want to lean on that. Well, um, I was actually going to touch a couple of other things first, uh, just to make sure that we have this in scope. Um, it's my understanding this is the first uh, non-monarchical Chinese system. Is that correct? Uh, basically, uh, because of the, regardless of whether they intended to follow through with it or not, a Chinese republic is quite an anomaly, an anomaly in Chinese history. Uh, am I missing anything there? I think in the sense that if the provisional government were actually to make it a republic in fact, not just a republic in name, right, right. I, would, I would agree with you. But how I would view this, this period between 1912 and 1928 is for a form of interregnum. It could have resulted in the restoration of a monarchy or, or yeah, some realistically. other form of government. Yes, realistically, it represents an, an interregnum, interregnum rather than an idealistic commitment to republicanism. Uh, right, but if you're on the ground sort of at the time and you basically see newspaper headlines, Republicans take power in China. Um, but but again, know, who, who's, who's reading those newspapers? It's the, the educated uh, elite in uh, Shanghai and Tianjin. It's not going to be the average peasant working. Right, right. No, I meant, I meant outside, sort of like th this is a this is quite the turn just in world history here, uh, regardless of whether they follow through with it or not. Um, this is the uh, basically you just see like a series of historical cycles, at least in in name just stop here you know this is the uh 
well, my, 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 sorry, Panama, my slight pushback against this again is looking at history with the benefit of hindsight. I, I would say this entire system looks like it's in flux at the moment and it's not 1912 doesn't seem like a definitive end as it definitely didn't seem like a definitive end in 1915 and 1916 and possibly again but in 1917 it, and 1918. It's an, it's an ongoing thing that that's, yeah. that's the only way they can see it and also I would say that a lot of the western powers in particular were were, were pretty pleased because immediately um Yuan Shikai begins a series of financial negotiations, um, which results in the, the setup of an international banking consortium, which for the next six or seven years will make a series of enormous loans um, to Yuan Shikai's government. Um, so, and I, and I believe that, that um, over the next few years and, and put for quite a bit after, I believe more concessions are actually taken. Um, well, 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 let me just um, qu qualify that because it's we've already talked about friction between the international powers with the open door policy in China. Well, this is where that friction exacerbates and some powers recede and some other powers come to the fore. Mm -hmm. So these, the, economic, this, the, the bureaucracy that effectively controlled the Chinese economy was called the Imperial Maritime Customs Service. And this was replaced by the Chinese Maritime Customs Service. It was British dominated now, but now it's actually being um, occupied by Chinese civil servants. And increasingly, it's going from a British phenomenon to an international phenomenon. Japan views the creation of a new government in China with with hostility to some degree because it represents a unstable situation in flux and they're concerned with consolidating their own limited spheres of influence. They already have inherited and controlled the Manchurian railway concessions and uh, Dalian, which was the former Port Arthur concession of Russia. Now that the next major contention is over the Shandong Peninsula. And this is a reason why the Chinese and the Japanese enter into World War I against the Germans, because they want to take away the German concessions, um, not just the international concessions in Tianjin, but in particular, the German sphere of influence in yeah. Shandong. Right. Um, so the British are receding, you can say managing their retreat slowly from China, whereas the Japanese are expanding their control over northeastern China. And around the same time that we have uh, Yuan Shikai becoming emperor of China, the Japanese attempt to put the screws in the Chinese government by demanding more concessions, more capitulations, a consolidation of the unequal treaty system, and also that all German seized territories would be given to Japan and not China during the war. And this is agreed by the Chinese government because the Chinese government effectively, as you mentioned, is short on money and the Japan Japanese are basically prepared to pay the ruling elite, the Beiyang elite in China in return for their surrender of sovereignty. When this is revealed after the war is over, it causes a national uprising, a student uprising throughout the cities on the eastern coast. Right, and you can see that on the map here. This red is the uh, German influence, this Shandong Peninsula. Um, Qingdao, if I remember correctly, was the German, uh, like the actually held German port there. Um, yeah. Uh, which would be sort of like in this this area right here, uh, south or the southern part of this peninsula. Um, if you look at this from the German perspective, um, you basically have no good way to supply anything over here in the German Far East. Uh, you have Northern Guinea basically uh, down to the south. Um, you don't really have any good way in because your colonies in Africa are one an extreme distance away uh, by boat. Uh, the German Navy is itself uh, no match for uh, the Entente Navy, um, and you know, the colonies as well that you would be using are being taken over. Um, so this is kind of just left out to dry. It's a question of who gets to take it. Um, so you know, the, the idea that Japan would take it instead of China, uh, which is the rationale for the student re rebellions, um, is quite insane. <laughs> so... Um, that's the, uh, I figured we could show this on the map to illustrate it better.
I think it's insane in the sense that you you actually believe that you have a sovereign nation, yes, but I think underpinning the political <laughs> well, reality that it's, yeah. it's completely understandable. Yeah, well, you're right, but you know, if you are a Chinese student at this point in time, finding out that this new uh, these new groups of leaders that were uh, promising you know great strides in Chinese um, strengthening and modernization have just sold off part of the country that could have been taken back for money, which, like as we mentioned, perfectly real. Um, geopolitical analysis there. Um, you're you're not going to be popular with the uh, with the country. No, and um, this um, among other things, it radicalizes a lot of would be Chinese revolutionaries, including one Mao Zedong, who was a librarian at this time. And uh, sort of apocryphally, this is sort of determined. This is sort of great political awakening and. Uh, but, but also just to, to emphasize another point regarding my, my view on British retreat, um, the British begin to retreat out of Shandong at the same time the Japanese are coming as if they see the writing on the wall. So what happens now? You know, we have a Japan which is increasingly assertive in the region because, again, a consolidated Republican regime in China behind, you know, a nationalist government and democratic polity could potentially be far more threatening than the Qing dynasty ever was, given the fundamental disconnect between the uh, the elite Manchu-based aristocracy and the Chinese people and the nature of the Chinese political system itself. So I do believe throughout the 1920s and 1930s, the reform movement in China does represent an existential threat and can explain quite a lot of Japan's actions and you can say increasing radicalism, fanaticism during this period. And this is spurned when we have the second coming of Sun Yat-sen, uh, which creates the Kuomintang. Just, just on a, another sort of tangent before I forget, when China is created as a republic, a new flag is created. And because the Qing dynasty flag, obviously it was imperial, so it would be inappropriate, but also it was heavily styled after the yellow, uh, the yellow banner of the eight banner army of the uh, Qing dynasty aristocracy and the, the armed forces. So that was entirely inappropriate. Instead, they created a banner of the five nations, supposedly of China. When Yuan Shik when uh, Sun Yat-sen comes back from Japan, he establishes himself near his own sort of uh, ethnic power base because he is not Han. To combine with all of these other idiosyncrasies of uh, Sun Yat-sen, he is one of the Hakka. And the Hakka just come from an area north of uh, Guangzhou, or Canton. And so he establishes himself there with an acquiescent set of warlords uh, under Li Zhongren uh, in the south of the country. And understanding that they were completely eclipsed in terms of organization and sort of political um, um, sort of political clout at the beginning of the revolution, we have political officers set up to expand the Chinese Republic, but also a military wing of the political party in the Kuomintang. And this is combined with a new look for the Kuomintang as they dispense with the five races flag and they replace it with a new flag, which many Western commentators believed was inspired by the fact that who was the principal foreign backer for Sun Yat-sen all of a sudden? It was the Soviet Union. Because it's not just the blue and uh, the blue flag and the white star, which is the party flag, it's also the red background as well. Um, so they yeah, believe sorry, that this was, that <laughs> so this was a, a potentially a socialist um, centralizing revolution in China, uh, which worried quite a few people in the sense that it was both nationalist and socialist. Right. And yeah, let me just present this here because I, <laughs> um, in my defense, there are, I think, six different Chinese flags flying around at this time. So this is the one that yeah. we can see yeah. that would cause issue. Um, so <laughs> this is actually something close to home of a flag causing uh, controversy because it has red in it. Um, the original Oklahoman flag was a nice, very red banner um, with a, with minor details on the front, and it had to be done away with because it was uh, seen as a potential communist uh, flag. Um, but yeah, not not nearly the same thing. I just figured that yeah, the the idea that a flag having red in it causing controversy may seem silly to people, um, but it happens constantly throughout this point in time. <laughs> 
Yes, this um, is 1924. So this is only a couple of years after the, or really during the, the, the cleanup of the civil war operations in Russia and at the height of the Red Scare. So, and given the fact that these were real, these were real fears, and given the fact that the Soviet Union had ordered the Chinese Communist Party to amalgamate with the Kuomintang, this was the stated policy of the uh, of the Soviet Union at that time was to achieve power through the Kuomintang and through Sun Yat-sen. Right. And you can uh, even go back to the stated principles of the Kuomintang with the uh, three principles. Um, you can very easily <clears throat> uh, turn that into something very communist sympathetic. Um, <clears throat> democracy and welfare, obvious. Um, you know, every communist country, except for the ones that we will see later in the 20th century will be very sympathetic to democracy um, and have their own democratic systems. Um, nationalism uh, would be something that would be, you know, amenable later, I would say, but perhaps that's an anachronism on my part because they well, initially well, they, seem to be hostile, but then favorable towards it. Uh, but within the Soviet Union, within this time, within the hardline political reality is not necessarily anachronistic at all because nationalism implies national unity implying one national government, one national government right, okay. which would acquiesce to the Soviet Union. That doesn't dispense with the fact that the Soviet Union were more than willing to peel away China's frontiers at this point. So <laughs> this is where Outer Manchuria just becomes, sorry, Outer Mongolia just becomes Mongolia. And right. Mongolia becomes a Soviet puppet state. And the Soviets begin to expand into uh, East Turkestan. They annex, uh, what is it, Tanatuva? Yeah, uh, one of the... Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, the, the Soviets have a keen interest and it should be noted that at this point, we do have a Chinese Communist Party, which has recently formed, but it's basically a, uh, a, a rich uh, clique within Shanghai and it's based off the, in, in, the industrial power of the workers within Shanghai at the moment. So it's a completely different ba a beast compared to what we're going to see with uh, Mao Zedong, but Mao Zedong is there. He is with uh, Zhou Enlai, who is the political director of the Wampo Military Academy, which is the the, the Kuomintang uh, political army, which is going to help lead the northern expedition. So there, there are many links. Um, and again, due to the the ideological sort of confusion of the nature of uh, Sun Yat-sen's political profile, it seems ideal to latch on these communistic and subversive elements onto a figure who was seen as an unblemished champion of the Republican nationalist ideal in China, who is Sun Yat-sen. Right. And with the uh, Soviet expansion uh, points as well, uh, you don't even in the twenties, if I remember correctly, they reinvade uh, Central Asia um, for the natural resources there mainly. And then also for uh, strategic interest. Um, that is the point in time where the Russian and Chinese borders finally get, uh, uh, finalized, uh, not to use the word final too much, but, um, you know, that is that point where they are, uh, reinvading some of the old imperial possessions that they actually finalize the Chinese border and push back, uh, you know, the Chinese frontier once again. Well, yeah, well, re regarding that, I mean, the, the, the there was a, a, a pan-Turkish uprising under the Emir of Bukhara. That's another stream. Right. I, I think yeah, I've yeah. discussed it once with uh, Semyagog, but yes, you're right. Regard uh, in terms of Almaty and Kazakhstan and those sort of borders and the uh, the Talas region and Fergana and all those. This was always a, a bone of contention. There were areas where the border was very secure, like Kazakh, like um, Afghanistan and the little panhandle, which separates the Raj from the Russian Empire, because that was of great concern in the Great Game. But I think it's easier to see this that the Soviet Union and the borders with China were an open question up until after the Second World War. Because um, even during the Second World War, there was a great question over the fate of Manchuria, because who ultimately defeated the Japanese occupation and the, uh, uh, the Kwantung army? It was the Soviets. It wasn't the, uh, it wasn't the Chinese. And who was, which government was the Soviet Union going to recognize? They first recognized the Republic, then they recognized Mao. So, uh, and of course, even up as late as 1944, they were thinking about taking East Turkestan and making it a new Soviet Socialist Republic. So, uh, right. they were, there were, yeah. Um, and before we get, yeah, but the, this will tie into sort of like the overall story here. Um, but yeah, I was just—I was going to 
briefly mention that uh, a, a good example of how the Western perception of um, Chiang Kai-shek would, would, would change over time. Um, I know that early on in the 20s, he was referred to as the Red Marshal Chang. Um, and then, uh, especially in the press, and then later on, of course, that, that would change. Uh, but yes, you, you mentioned the the correlation between Soviet support, a seemingly red flag, and um, what what was assumed to be a kind of socialistic policy um, certainly didn't didn't do wonders for his image um, in the Western spheres. Not not early on, anyway. Right. Uh, just on just just on Chiang Kai Shek. I mean, he was the Red Marshal because he was the head of the Red, effectively the Red Army in China, the closest thing they had to it. Um, so no one really knew because he wasn't he wasn't so much of a political operative in terms of a political ideology so long as Sun Yat-sen was alive. But Sun Yat-sen was dying, and he would die just before the Northern Expedition, which was the attempt to restore control over of the nominal Republican regime in China, away from the the great warlords such as uh, Sun Xuanfeng and uh, Wu Pefi. So uh, it, it's complicated. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's fair to say that given the the nature of the collaboration between the Communist Party and the Kuomintang, that a superficial remark that he was the Red Marshal could have been warranted. Of course, it wasn't proven later on, but yeah. Right. And uh, I will pull up all the pictures that we need to uh, get through that. But, um, you know, this is just the uh, a visual representation. This uh, darker area is what Russia would seize throughout the course of a century, more or less. Um, the Russian Empire would, of course, have control of most of this orange region. It would be lost during the uh, Russian Revolution and the chaos that ensued there. The Soviets would push back into it to uh, borders that might look very modern down here in the south. And this border over here with China um, would be subject to great scrutiny by the Russians um, just because the regime that would uh, that had you know de facto control of this region of China by the point that the Russians met with them. Um, if I remember correctly, it was one set of familial warlords and another one was led by you know socialists. So... It, it in Xinjiang. Um, can I just, uh, on this map, just to, to clarify, there did seem for a moment that China had expanded to a, a natural boundary in the 19th century. And the boundary would have been at uh, Lake Balkash, you can right. see, um, just from the west of the Chinese border. And th this is also, the, you could say, the the furthest extent of Chinese civilization west in general. So when we have the Tang Dynasty, uh, they tend to expand up to the cities of the Fagana Valley, like Tashkent, as you can see here, um, and then expand no further. This is sort of where China meets Islamic civilization. But yes, right. as you can see, there is a, a moderate uh, expansion eastwards. Um, but really, in the grand scheme of things, you know, other than the, the meager sort of resources and oil in uh, Xinjiang, this wouldn't compare to Russian control over Manchuria, which was permanently right. lost after uh, 1904, 1905. Right. So I figured I would just bring that up. But um, so I do believe that we are ready to start talking about um, the collapse of a Chinese central authority, uh, unless I'm skipping anything in the inter interim. Um, the only thing I would add that we slightly missed is that... Um, we, we mentioned the regional military academies, um, which become power bases in, in, in and of themselves. Um, it should also be noted that while President um, Yuan Shikai um, sort of, uh, that he, he reforms the provincial administration somewhat, and he creates this system where every province has a an appointed civilian governor and civil service, but also has a military governor who is responsible for the province um as well so the military governor doesn't just sort of administer the the, the various sort of troops that are that are stationed around they actually do have quite a bit of political power and of course as we know this will become total um in the various regions um so i it's just an important uh an important thing to add when dealing with how china turns into the sort of um warlording era that it will that we're about to cover yes and uh i mean i mean the warlords were 
of various political stripes. I mean, the majority of them were apolitical. Some were sort of more nationalistic. Some were more ambitious. Like you, you mentioned, one warlord tried to restore Puyi. Um, another warlord deposed Puyi and uh, chased the Qing court out of the um, out of the Forbidden City. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is no overarching ideology, and there is no there is a nominal president of China. Um, but the warlords mainly serve themselves. But they're, they're mainly uh, self-serving and decentralized. I might point out we have a uh, one of the uh, members of our audience has made a uh, comparison uh, from uh, Yuan Shikai to a uh, more modern uh, political leader. I will uh, just uh, show that now just because I find it absolutely hilarious. <laughs> no, I no. would. Uh, I, I would... don't think it's meant to be serious. I just find it hilarious. <laughs> yes. I wonder so, if uh, Blair would ever sort of take to the blingy uniforms like that because I he's he's quite sort of um, he's he's quite austere, isn't he? With his no tie and simple suit and everything. saving saving of course his garter robes. Panama. Oh, the garter robes, which he was clearly loving. So to be fair, if if he well, well, I mean, he pretty much is in power. But when when he makes his return to formal power, um, and maybe has himself made king. Of, uh, of of the UK as 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 Yuan, as Yuan Shikai did in in China, then you know he, perhaps perhaps no he he won't adopt a title as lofty. It'll be it'll be the perpetual dictator, and then it'll be a a, a stepping stone to be the first world emperor. He he wouldn't he wouldn't uh, <laughs> reduce his title to be you know the mere sort of a uh, potentate of the United Kingdom. I think no, uh, his ambitions are much greater. I think or I think perhaps maybe he might echo um, Francia down in. Uh, Paraguay, you know, the kind of uh, the austere academic who comes to who comes to power and, and reforms and, you know, plays plays the Machiavellian game extremely well. Right. So um, on that note, I will uh, just to kind of start off the discussion and we can work backwards as much as we want to. Um, you know, this is the state of China in 1925. How did we get here? What's going on? Where's the central authority? You know, how, how could this happen? You know, we have nationalists in the South with their varying coalitions. And then we have just the rest of uh, what could be considered China proper divided into all these different coalitions. And then even out West, we have, you know, Muslim families ruling regions. We have socialist parties ruling regions. We have, you know, religious orders taking over countries. Yeah. How did, well, how could things decline so quickly? Well, I'm going to be the I'm going to turn that question completely on its head, turn it, and say that this is more of a accurate reflection of the political reality over the last 120 years or so. Um, you know, China has always had to rely on you know regional commanders. You know, they're in English they're known as the commanderies, and on this map you can see the image of the red sphere around Zhili and Shandong and Manchuria, that really reflects the sort of accurate reach, not even really the accurate reach of the central imperial government in Beijing. Everywhere else was under the control of some sort of local viceroy or potentate. If anything, it was more extreme than this. So what you see with the warlords is a consequence of a hundred of hundreds of years of the in, in, an inability to do what the Japanese did, which was politically centralize and create a unitary state divided into you know a centralized system of prefectures. China was unable to do this. So the fall of the Qing dynasty revealed the fact that China had disunited. And so what we see over the course of 1912 up until 1949 is not just a series of political revolutions, but the need to reunite China, not just internally, but in the face of external threats as well. And not just external threats in terms of Japan, but we're talking about a wholesale revolution against the unequal treaty system and undoing the century of humiliation. So you can see this as a accurate reflection of what had been going on in the 19th century, stripped bare, in the same way that, you know, you could say that the president of China at this time had as much power as the emperor of China did a century before. It didn't really matter. Power was vested in other spheres. And the ironic thing is that local Chinese potentates are 
becoming more powerful vis-a-vis -vis the West than they were before. So if anything, this image doesn't, doesn't tell the whole picture if you're looking at this within the context of the last two centuries. Fantastic. So um, I don't know how specifically we want to cover this because we kind of, where we left off and sort of the main picture was, um, you know, the uh, Sun Yat-sen, the nationalists kind of get expelled from the central government as it were. Um, and, you know, we talked about Yuan Shikai basically taking power, the Beiang army, um, trying to choose leaders among, themse among themselves. Shikai proclaims himself emperor. This does not go over well. He eventually dies. There's no real uniting figure around them. So just to, just to uh, start this off then, is there a central moment of uh, collapse of the Chinese government? Or is this, does this just kind of evolve out of the death of Shikai and the uh, ensuing uh, government, uh, I, government I, that I took over? I, I think, sorry, go ahead, Panama. I, I think what AM said before is essentially correct. It's that it's not really this big momentous collapse. It's that this is reflective of the reality of how China has been ruled for for, 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 for some time, essentially, that that it, it was always ready to default to something like this um, when central authority collapsed, or what, what central authority there was, depending on the time. I mean, what does right, central, right, there... what, what central authority mean, I think? I mean, what did Yuan Shikai represent? Yuan Shikai represented a personal form of government. You can say a paternalistic form of government based on active collaboration. What Yuan Shikai's death really represents is the end of a figure who could only superficially unite these independent power centers together. And even then, I would say Yuan Shikai was an aberration. Yuan Shikai comes to power very briefly before the final fall of the Qing Dynasty, having assumed that rank as basically the, uh, the Warwick kingmaker of the Qing Dynasty in the early 20th century and then is unable to transform that role into central authority. He has to rely instead of this uh, network of patronage. Right, but just so for people that are unaware of this, um, it's my understanding that there was no like one central event where all these warlords just like declare independence or all this other stuff and start fighting. Like it's literally no, it's just, just on paper. Control, yeah. Right. On paper, if you were to look at a map, China is still there. It's just no one treats it like that because that's not the case but also it should be noted that due to the size i mean there's no obvious capital of china either you know beijing was the capital of the qing dynasty and so it remained the capital of china superficially just because it inherited that role of the capital but as you can see there's no reason as to why beijing logically follows should be the capital of China when you have all of these major power centers. I mean, the two other powers, the three other, well, four, <laughs> just, I'm just thinking about it, then more and more. I mean, I talked right at the beginning of this about the Yangtze, the Yellow Rivers, and the Pearl River. Well, where does the center of this new sort of Norman expedition begin? It begins in Canton, it begins in Guangzhou in the extreme south, where the blue areas are. Um, where is like the economic heart of China? It's nowhere near Beijing, it's in Shanghai. And the closest thing to an imperial capital to there is Nanking, Nanjing. Um, but then of course you have the interior of China. Uh, you have Wuchang, which will later amalgamate three to cities and become the modern city of Wuhan, um, slightly to, yeah. And then of course you have the Sichuan Valley, the, you know, the, the fertile um, and resource-rich Sichuan Valley, um, where Chongqing is the main city. So, and even during the course of the Second World War, Wuchang and Chongqing will also become the capitals of China. So there is no obvious center of authority. China was already decentralized and China is huge. I mean, any of these blobs you can see on the map would be larger, infinitely larger than Germany or France. It's still huge, right. even, even within that context. Ten, tens of millions of people, if not hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. hundreds. Um, so, yeah, I, I just figured I would get that out there because I'm just trying to imagine this from the perspective of someone that hasn't really delved into this. You know, there's not like a... You know, it's not like the Roman emperor saying we can no longer pay our debts and then you have some historians saying this is the collapse of Western Rome or something like that. No. It, one of the theories. Um, you know, it, this is literally just... Um, you have a group of people that take over from the nominal monarchy. They make it a nominal republic and then another nominal empire. 
Um, and then basically you just kind of slide into these people act, you know, at, at least in the last few centuries, they were heavily, heavily decentralized, but there was a uh, sort of like a show of subservience to the, to the emperor. Um, you, you just don't have that sort of like, you don't have that uh, theater anymore. So you know, you, you've slid into this uh, regionalism here. Yes, I think um, this is a good note to talk about the Northern Expedition. So you can right. see on this map blue, it, it should also be noted that these are also um, warlord regions. So this is warlord acquiescence as well. And when the Northern Expedition moves out of this region into the right red blob, um, these regions revert back to being red blobs <laughs> as well to make it even more confusing. Right, but, but now they're KMT red blobs. But they, yeah, but now, well, no, well, not even really. You know, Li Zhongreng was, uh, you know, the new Guangxi clique were, were, were effectively autonomous. But so we have the KMT, we have a political army. Yun Sa uh, uh, Yat Sen is dead. Now the control of the force is in flux because we have communists, we have Zhou Enlai, and we have Chiang Kai-shek, and we have uh, Wu Jingwei, uh, who is the sort of close confidant, and you can say the political heir of um, uh, Wang Jingwei or Sun Yat-sen. So it's not obvious who is going to take over power. The Northern Expedition goes ahead. It is able to assume control in the right blob um, you can see on that map. And during this time, we have the taking of power in China proper. And then Chiang Kai-shek does something rather momentous. He decides that corresponding with his military victories and the unification of central China, he is going to purge the communists from the, from the ranks. So as the army reaches Shanghai, the communists basically have to make a choice. Do they join in with the Kuomintang or do they force themselves into political exile? And people like Mao and Zhou Enlai go into a form of political exile while the northern expedition continues. As the expedition further marches north and basically de dethrones the, uh, the, 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 the nominal government in Peking, Beijing, uh, Wang Jingwei goes off and forms his own left section of the Kuomintang and establishes himself in Wuchang. During this time, as a means of, you can say, trying to achieve a continuity in the unequal treaties and the international settlements, the foreign powers reflect the reality on the ground by switching their recognition of the Peking government to the Nanjing government. Now, why does um, Chiang Kai-shek establish a government in Nanjing? Well, kind of like Comrade Eidenauer and uh, moving the capital to Bonn in West Germany, uh, he has a local regional power center there, uh, which is reconfirmed with the Northern Expedition. But more symbolically than that, Peking and the Northern capital is rather remote from the core of China. And it was also associated with the Qing dynasty and with Imperial China in general. Nanjing was also associated with Imperial China, but it was associated as the southern capital of the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty being the last great Chinese native dynasty. Right. So, times were better. Yes, times were better. It represented a symbolic move to the center in the heart of Han power, but also it was reasonably close to the economic center of China in Shanghai as well. So, the, and of course, you know, it. Um, the, the, the traditional sort of Machiavellian maxim that when you conquer a new area, you reposition your capital into that area as well. So this was a power base with which to try and project control over central China in a way that hadn't really been achieved over the last couple of a couple of hundred years. Right. And it might be worth noting, uh, who were they invading? Why was there a need for an expedition from the south? Like, obviously, the nationalists weren't up there, so they had to... Uh... They had to march and uh, take control of the uh, rest of China that they've been expelled from, basically. But, you know, who was up there instead? You know, uh, we have different warlord, warlord cliques uh, that you can look into that you might have saw on the previous map with all the different distinct red blobs. If you notice, they weren't all connected. And that is for good reason. Um, you had different forms of the, uh, of the old Chinese military uh, would coalesce around different people and different factions and different geographical areas. Um, you had some that were more friendly towards Japan, 
uh, like the ones up here, uh, either by financial or uh, political interest, or perhaps even just being puppets of Japan, if you will. Um, you had uh, the rest of the uh, army sort of in a separate clique that tended to coalesce down here um, with a separate faction as well, if I remember correctly, in this sort of central region. Um, basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, these are all just leftovers of the Beiang government, the Chinese military, uh, coalesced around different figures, is it not? Yes, and um, the, I mean, they, they remove key figures like uh, Wu Piafu and uh, Sun Xuan Fang, but it's not an end of warlordism. What, what the Northern Expedition does is compensate for the complete political weakness of the early nationalists, the early republicans, by establishing a core power base in the south with an ethnic center in the form of the hacker population supporting um, the Kuomintang. And then they move to establish a slightly larger base of operations, a power base. But this isn't a total reunification of China by any means. Really, I mean, we're talking about a quarter of the total territory of the modern People's Republic of China. Um, but we're talking about the most populous areas, the most economically viable areas. But in terms of the periphery, um, we have law warlords in Yunnan. Tibet is virtually at, um, independent. We have uh, uh, Sheng Shikai in uh, Xinjiang. And we have an independent warlord in Manchuria. And of course, we have the Japanese. So this is only a partial restoration, but it is the closest thing that... Uh, China has to some sort of sovereign government in a very long time. Um, it sh I, I should also say uh, the histories of the warlords themselves makes for fantastic reading. Um, I highly, I highly recommend people uh, look up the exploits of the various uh, sort of, you know, potentates and this kind of thing. Um, well, uh, that's what uh, you used to sort of uh, advertise the stream on Twitter. It was a quote from one of them, was it not? Yes, that was by um, Sun Chuan Fang, who I believe was um, a warlord from around um, uh, somewhere around Nanking, who was deposed in the mid twenties, I think. Who said uh, that? Uh, I'll, I'll remember the quote. It's that he. It's that it says he said, "I'm no politician. I I I hate them more than anything." They're all bootlickers and whores, kissing goodbye to the old ways and spreading their legs for the new. No, I'm a good and honest warlord. Um, I just I like that because it gives it gives some insight into the climate of 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 of, of, of what of what's happening here and the the perceptions of what these of what these things actually are. Um, because I believe I mean the the term warlord has certain connotations in English and it's not inaccurate, but um, I, th I think it, it would almost be fair to say that that these figures are more like sort of regional aristocracies in a, yeah. in a sort of in a sort of medieval war. They're sort of like the the, the uh, barons of of China in that sense, mm. um, ra rather than what we would consider us uh, we would consider a, a, a warlord today when when we talk about you know kind of rebels in in Africa or in, in the Middle East or whatever. Um, these are these are far more formal. Um, power structures these are far more formal bases of control you know with control over entire provinces some of them have their own government some of them mint their own currency um they have independent means of securing weapons and supplies um they establish trade pacts with each other i mean it's yeah right and you uh you guys mentioned this whenever we were talking about the collapse of basically the Qing and then later the republic and the empire um each of these provinces that you see on the map is a formal division uh, that was either existent already or became an administrative division. They each have their own military schools or the region would have a, mil a military school or something like that. Um, so uh, all of these people that are governing these provinces as warlords are not necessarily like the strongest person with the most guns or something like that. Usually it was like this guy was the head of the military academy. This guy was like the head of this local division. Uh, something similar to that. He was just seen as the natural leader for this province, uh, and so he took it over uh, and then started doing as uh, Panama Hat just said. Um, and it's also worth noting as well, some of these places had their own local political battles. Like, it wasn't all just um, non-ideological in the uh, South with the nationalists. Um, 
there was a movement for a federal government in China. And in the Chinese sense, as opposed to the American sense, this was seen as sort of like a more lefty faction. Uh, usually it tended to be concerned more with uh, uh, social welfare, extreme democratization, all this other stuff. Um, if you moved up north uh, to the less democratic uh, uh, regions, uh, typically it would be you know political strife between um, you know foreign policy. Who do we ally ourselves with? Do we go on our own? How much do we modernize? Uh, you know, there, there would be these things were basically functioning societies uh, that had just emerged out of a you know a, a complete collapse and anything unifying them. Can I can I add a note on yes you you brought up about federalism um, when China was created as a new republic as we saw it was the the five races flag and why would a federal movement exist to such a strong extent in the south well the south is the center of the Cantonese the Cantonese language and the Hakka minority and in fact the further away you get from core China the more you have ethnic and linguistic and religious diversity, the most prominent sort of non-Eastern sect in China, of course, being the Muslims. So when we talk about federalism, we're talking about equal rights and a recognition of this linguistic diversity. However, this comes against the ideas of Han, political nationalism, Han unity, but also the hard reality is that you need to project strong power to the Western world in order to finally assert Chinese sovereignty. Right. And it's also might be worth noting as well. Um, a lot of the people that would be drawn to these more you know, Western political systems, uh, you know, federalism, I don't necessarily think is native to China uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, they would typically be supported by the, you know, what we would consider the middle class, um, or at least at this point in time in history, lawyers, doctors, um, librarians, the literate population that was not in the bureaucratic or the military uh, sector of society. Um, but there's also a cynical reason why foreign powers would support federalism as well. Oh, well, Federal yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, federalism, not only does it mean that there is a weak center, but federalism also means that you can pit all the various nationalities against each other. And when we finally right. get to the East Asian co-prosperity sphere, you're going to see that ad nauseum. Right. And, you know, there's also the, uh, you know, you don't have to draw up your spheres of influence and partitions and all of that if they will do it for you. You know, you can just go after this uh, sub-federal entity, uh, get these uh, favorable conditions. And then now, you know, they basically just done the work for you. So... And of course, the most naked example of this would be annexing East Turkestan to the Soviet Union. So, right. yeah. And so that was the uh, that was the push from the south. Um, if I remember correctly, there were ex I, I'm going to use this uh, term with the I know it's vague in definition, but hopefully people will understand what I mean. A sort of extreme militant nationalism that was tied to a uh, sort of like religious revival almost up here in this region and the more populated parts of the country near uh, Beijing and the Shandong Peninsula. Uh, I don't, if I remember correctly, they didn't necessarily go anywhere, but that's sort of where you're, uh, if we're saying federalism is sort of like the, if you will, the softer left ideology that's getting pushed here from the South, um, you would find your more uh, right wing or right wing looking uh, warlords and despots up here in the North area. Yeah, because the North is the most susceptible to Japanese and Russian right. expansion. So, yeah, you have an existential threat there. Um, I, I think just regard, regarding that, I think it's important to consider like what the nationalists were under Chiang Kai-shek, because we previously been talking about rather nebulous concepts of democracy, whatever, the, whatever that means. Well, the, the first sort of attempt of Chiang Kai-shek to actually put a, a name to this philosophy is this idea of um, the new life movement, which was basically like a, a, a sort of civilizational sort of a moral self-strengthening movement as a way to try to unite the Chinese people. Many elements, rather you can say some superficially less, some less superficially were trying to mimic Italian fascists. So you had the blue shirt the blue shirts, faction. Right, yeah. And these factions were in a sort of a way that mimicked the boxers from before these more radical groups wanted a complete end to the unequal treaties. 
so in many senses you can say that Chiang Kai-shek represented a more moderate within the military faction because when he marched north there were desperate attempts and localized attempts to target westerners and to confiscate their property that this would be seen as a you know not just a unification but throughout the dread the you know the, the dreaded westerner and this didn't happen um it only happened piecemeal on the ground it wasn't a, a formal policy so Chiang Kai-shek was stuck between purging the communists from his political faction on the one side and preventing the hardline nationalists within this faction of provoking some form of western um, response but more importantly a japanese response and that is ultimately what happens in manchuria um i think it's also worth um making a note of the fact that he expels um what the kmt call the manchu rats uh from the forbidden city um the oh, 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 he does he doesn't there. actually he doesn't actually um expel the family he does however ransack their tombs and yes. uh, loot uh, and loot the imperial city and this is mo motivation for what we're going to see later when Puyi uh, inexplicably um, enters into the historical stage once again with Japan yes um, it's a yes it's a, it's a warlord after after Chang that, that that expels them isn't it right and before we uh before we jump ahead back quickly um and i don't want to drag us down too terribly much because we are rapidly approaching the three hour mark um not that's necessarily uh significant but um you know we do see on this <laughs> we do see on this map um you see uh the valley here that we talked about uh sorry Sichuan. i'm not going to be able to pronounce half of these names I think, so forgive I think me that's correct yes so um, this this valley is going to become important uh, later, especially in the Second Sino-Japanese War. But um, for all intents and purposes, they aren't necessarily um, connected to most of these cliques and goings on of the rest of the core of China. Um, they're far enough away and populated enough to where it's very difficult to exert control on them. And if memory serves correctly, they mostly stay neutral in a lot of these uh, conflicts, uh, later joining the nationalists uh, just because the military governors and the companies and the railroads there uh, don't really have an interest in joining half of these armies over here. But I could have misremembered that. Uh, so AM, please. Well, well, as you can, uh, as I pointed out, the, the main interest is on establishing a core in eastern central China. The Sichuan is interesting in the sense that it's very resource rich, but it's also it's basically a self-contained area with its own mountainous um, natural frontiers. Um, so it's it's rather sort of susceptible to sort of splitting off and forming its own thing. This is actually where coming back to the communists works quite well. Um, before we get onto the Japanese angle, they happen around the same time, but um, it, it would just be interesting to talk about this, read the sort of interior warlords. When the communists are split off and purged from the ranks of the Kuomintang, um, basically the center of power of the Communist Party in Shanghai is moved from Shanghai into the interior in uh, Jiangxi, uh, which is just... Um, uh, west of uh, Fuzhou, you can see, and uh, north of uh, Guangzhou. And they exist there and form their own model Soviet government. And then I believe it's in 1934 that the Kuomintang, which has received uh, German uh, Western military specialists, uh, begins a military push against the communists. And this begins the long march from uh, Jiangxi, which ends up in Yunnan in the north in uh, Shaanxi province. And what, the, what they effectively do is they push the, China, the communist army into the interior. And by doing so, they force, as you can see through Sichuan and Yunnan, and as a result, they force the local warlords to actually appeal to the Republican, the central Republican government for help, and so actually bring them on board, using basically the communists as some sort of roaming and Trojan horse, which can potentially threaten all of them, at the same time weakening and killing off hundreds of thousands of the supporters of the, uh, the Soviet Republic. So when they arrive in Yunnan, there is a centralized leadership under Mao, there is the 
beginning of the People's Liberation Army, whatever's left of it, and they basically establish a, a, a cave government in the north. But in the meantime, it seems that Chiang Kai-shek has actually used the communist threat effectively to affect a centralization of China around these um, border areas and these more mountainous areas, but at a cost. Because what's happening in the East is that Japan is in the process of formally annexing Manchuria. Right. And before we get on to that, um, this map uh, showcases a couple of things. Um, as you mentioned, most of the communist support was uh, near the coastline. Um, and most of these, uh, most of their initial leaders uh, are going to come from a more literate sort of middle class, uh, which is a shock to anyone that might know their communist organizing history. Um, and basically what's happening here um, is there's going to be a real test of loyalty because these uh, sort of middle class Chinese men are going to be pushed from the more developed uh, coastline uh, where they can also get more supporters uh, just by nature of the people living there. And they're going to be pushed into the, you know, the countryside of farmers, warlords, uh, Muslims, and uh, yeah. some of the more other religious minorities that tend to be uh, completely shielded from any sort of Western influence altogether, at least on the ground. So uh, there's also a positioning issue there for the communists. It's not necessarily just, you know, their raw numbers have been, what was it? Didn't they lose like 60% or something like that of their people? On the long march, I think more than that. Um, okay. I don't, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I, the losses were absolutely horrific. But right. what what you're what you're demonstrating here is that the geography actually matters in terms of the political implications of the Chinese Communist Party. But because before Mao took over, the Chinese Communist Party was pretty much faithful in terms of its uh, Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy and adherence right. to the idea that the proletariat and the more Western areas, the more developed areas, would be the ones responsible for bringing out the communist revolution in China. Because of the physical dislocation of the communist movement from the working classes in Shanghai and pushing them into the countryside, Mao fundamentally transforms the nature of Chinese communism from a urban proletariat movement into effectively a peasant guerrilla fighting force. Right. And he's one of the first you know, serious communist rulers to consider the peasantry as the main source of the power of you know, Chinese leftism rather than the urban working classes. And this is reflected in the political geography of the movement itself. And of course, you know, on the one hand, it's moving to Yunnan in order to link up to Outer Mongolia, which was under Soviet control. On the other hand, it is ideologically moved far away from Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy. Right, and you know that's obviously you can uh, that will have implications later down the line that will uh, culminate into things like the Sino-Soviet split. Perhaps um, you'll have a lot of a uh, during this time, if I remember correctly. By the time uh, that the Chinese communists established themselves up here uh, more northward. Um, there were quite a lot of intellectual battles between Soviets and the Chinese communists that would lend to the Soviets supporting the Kuomintang over the Chinese communists just because of that uh, ideological shift that you just mentioned. Uh, well, it, I mean, I mean, it's not necessarily that simple. Like, like I, like I said before, the the communists um, were forced into an alliance with the Kuomintang. Right. Because the Soviets believed that the Kuomintang would be a better vehicle for achieving power. So better to subvert the winning party as opposed to being a ideologically devoted but you know peripheral and irrelevant right. force, which is what they believed they were becoming under Mao Zedong. But you're right in the sense that the Soviets were concerned that Mao, Mao Zedong was becoming far too autonomous and moving away from direct Soviet control, and he was uncontrollable um, in many respects. But this also re represents the failure of Plan A. Um, for the Soviet Union. And this is where I really have to come back and talk about, I'll just briefly overview it and you can talk about it in more detail if you mm -hmm. want. But the Japanese are already in Korea. The Japanese have taken over the Russian concessions in Manchuria. After a the Mukden incident, which is basically a false flag to justify that there was a, a, a Chinese attempt at sabotaging uh, Japanese property and strategic infrastructure in Manchuria that provided the local Japanese colonels, not the central government, a pretext to conduct a 
conquest of Manchuria. At the same time, we see a military coup in Japan proper. So basically, this is an independent military adventure, which is then supported by a military faction gaining power within Japan proper. And you can say this is one of the representations of the termination of civilian government and the higher, the ascension of the military and this contest between the Navy and the army in Japan. But as a consequence of this, Chiang Kai-shek orders the forces on the ground who are loyal to him not to resist the invasion. Basically, the Japanese go through Manchuria with virtual impunity, and they also expand into Inner Mongolia and expand up until Peking and will later take over Peking, underlying the importance of having a capital in the center, but even that is vulnerable to attack, as will be proven in 1937. At this time, Chiang Kai-shek is focusing on internal pacification. So his fundamental policy of using the communists to try and whip up um, support for the nationalist government is at odds with the whole nationalistic mission of uniting China against a foreign enemy when that foreign enemy is taking over legal Chinese territory with fundamental impunity. So this reaches to 1936, and this is where the Long March and Chiang Kai-shek's policy towards Japan fundamentally changes because the communists are able to abduct Chiang Kai-shek. And it is here where the Soviet Union intervenes and orders the Communist Party not to kill Chiang Kai-shek, to release him. However, it is on the condition that he forms a second united front with the Communist Party, abandons this idea of the internal pacification of China, and focuses on the external enemy, which is Japan. So if anything, the communists have used the abduction of Chiang Kai-shek to force a return to their previous position and focusing instead on a communist coalition government of China to defeat what is ultimately the greater threat to the Soviet Union's own security interests, which is an expansive and vast Kwantung army based in Manchuria, which has been turned to basically into a military factory. And as we see with uh, uh, Karl Kengol, the Japanese actually make excursions into the Soviet Union itself. So this is a reflection not just of the ideological um, demands of the Soviet Union, but also of the political necessity of preserving the borders of the Soviet Union against an increasingly radical and maverick Japan. Right, and the map, of the, all the maps that you can find of Japanese expansion will include, obviously, their extents in uh, World War II, but um, for the time being, this sort of green area that you can see uh, discounting Japan and Sakhalin, uh, which would be gained at different excursions into uh, different empires. Um, you know, Manchuria up here uh, is what we're talking about. If you remember the previous maps, they were their own um, warlord faction, um, but now they're under Japanese control. Um, I don't know if you have a specific uh, side on this, AM, but um, I find that People divide it between they were just too ineffective to present a, uh, a defense to Japan, and then some people will just say that they sold out to Japan entirely. <clears throat> so um, I don't know which one is necessarily more accurate. Well, I'm, fa I'm more favorable to Chiang Kai-shek in the sense that this would have been impossible to resist. Effectively, we're, we're talking about arriving at a, a, a situation where China could possibly win the war. And even six years later, when the second uh, Sino-Japanese war actually starts, even then China was woefully unprepared to resist the initial expansion of Japan. So I believe that given the capacity of the Chinese army at the time and the foreign advice it was receiving, Chiang Kai-shek believed that he was fighting an enemy he could defeat and could use by proxy to unify the rest of China, whilst he couldn't essentially touch Japanese political interests until the issue was forced by the abduction. So, like I said, I don't see a, a, a scenario in which the increasingly sort of national, the increasingly sort of fanatical Japanese army could have been defeated by the disorganized and also it should be noted potentially disloyal forces of the nationalist army. All right. And um, with that as well, um, it might be worth noting uh, that the Japanese were also uh, potentially threatening Mongolia, which yeah, seems uninhabited and relatively unimportant. 
Um, but that is a nice buffer for the Soviets against the rest of China should anything happen. So if the Japanese were to take that from them, not only is Japan now threatening a, a much larger um, field of attack, if you will, um, but if Mongolia is gone and potentially either reclaimed by China or becomes itself independent, no longer subservient to the uh, Soviets or the Russians, um, there's a large security threat there, especially because you now have a, a much more open run to uh, Lake Baikal and yeah. the other part, you have a, a much, uh, do the infrastructure, you can very easily go um, westward as opposed to uh, having to go all the way through Russian Siberia. So um, there's other threats there that the, the well, Japanese did make known. Well, this is a the worst sort of possible result of Russia having lost the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 to 1905, having a strong and expansive power operating within this particular area. But also this brings into, in, into the fore your previous uh, point about federalism and the unity of China and the individual ethnicities against the Han majority. Because Japan cleverly, rather than simply expanding for the sake of creating a larger Japan, presents this as a fight for the self-determination of the local ethnicities. So when they took over Manchuria, I mean, to be, be more cynical, this, this had absolutely no weight of it. The only reason why the Chinese, uh, the Japanese army established a puppet government and not a direct annexation is so that the army would directly control it as opposed to the uh, Chinese, the Japanese colonial ministry. So that's the only reason they did it. But in so doing, they put Puyi, the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, in as the chief of state and later in 1934 as the emperor of the state of Manchuria or Manchukuo. Then they replicate this process with Inner Mongolia and they establish a local Inner Mongolian puppet. So they are revising the territory of a projected united China all the time. And they are using the nationalities of China as a potential Trojan horse with which to weaken this idea of a united China. And so this is why I argue that the government of Chiang Kai-shek, had it successfully united China, would have represented some sort of existential threat to Japan. So they are preemptively stopping that by fomenting the rebellion of the local ethnicities against the Han majority. Alrighty, and so now we have our story in play here. Basically, the nationalists have pushed forward into the uh, north um, and established a central authority. The communists have been pushed out into the countryside, uh, well, multiple countrysides, and uh, forced to uh, you know, be in league with the uh, Kuomintang, the Chinese nationalist, um, in order to present a uh, front to Japan, uh, both an interest for the two of them, or at least as it was phrased, and uh, also to uh, help preserve Soviet security. And just to underscore just how weird that is to my eyes, like here's the, here's the famous photo, really strange to me, but um, that's it. Uh, that's your united front. Um, the most ambitious crossover of all time, they said. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have a we have an ever expansive Japan uh, threatening not just uh, the Chinese, uh, well, or at least parts of the Chinese, uh, but also the Soviets and potentially the Western powers. Uh, which then leads me to a question: Am uh, how is the West reacting to all of this? You know, it's the 1920s, people are rich, things seem to be going pretty well. Um, people are grappling with their colonial holdings that they had received from World War I. Um, what might be going on with the uh, Europeans at the very least? Because I could cover America if you could uh, get, you know, Britain or France. Well, obviously, Austria, Hungary and Germany no longer have concessions in China. Um, regarding France and Britain, who are the two main powers, they still have their international settlements. They still have their system of unequal treaties, despite the rise of Chiang Kai-shek. And they will continue to hold on to this up until the Second World War, in which these systems are going to be expunged by the Japanese, and then legally recognized after the fact, with a couple of notable exceptions, such as Hong Kong. Other than that, the British policy and the French policy 
is very much that of managed decline and careful retreat for fear of provoking the Japanese into a general conflagration in the East, which they knew they couldn't win and was perfectly demonstrated when we see the rapid expansion of Japan after 1941. All righty. So um, that was very good there. Um, I figured I should probably also cover the United States, um, who um, by the end of this period uh, will be governed by a president who was present in the uh, Boxer Rebellion uh, quite hilariously. Um, but uh, sort of at the start of the 20s, and throughout um, in the United States, there was a giant fear of the, uh, you know, the communists, as we were discussing beforehand, that sort of red flag, Soviet backing, uh, you know, nationalism, democracy, welfare uh, ideas spreading throughout China uh, does not really lend itself well to the American public, who's having probably the most extreme red scare out of most uh, Western countries at this point in time. Um, so there's a there's an extreme distrust of China, and then whenever fighting starts to kick off between these warlords in great degree, there is a national security interest in the United States that are saying basically, um, we're going to have so many Chinese men uh, coming to the shores to just to escape this uh, political fracturing uh, that they are going to take over the country, and as such, you get the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, um, which is passed in the 1920s, uh, which prohibits you know literally anyone from China from getting into the country under very few um, exceptions. Um, you have an even stricter crackdown on immigration as well across the board with quotas. Um, and throughout this whole time frame, you have uh, the U.S. government trying to, um, trying to establish treaties with the Japanese and the uh, Soviets now that they have established themselves to um, basically make sure that there is an American interest in the Far East um, we don't really see too terribly much negotiation between American officials and China, um, except for a couple of diplomatic incidents. And there's also business interests that the Americans have in China, especially in Shanghai and Shandong, uh, those two highly wealthy, highly populous uh, areas on the Chinese coastline um, that will you know, basically just have a uh, sort of watchful eye over um, as we mentioned, America was late getting into this, so they don't really have concessions to retreat from. It's really just making sure that business can keep going in as much a uh, fashion as possible without uh, threatening the political reality back at home. So um, is there anyone else we really need to cover for this sort of interim period before warfare kicks off proper between the Japanese and the Chinese? I mean, we're where are we now? We're in nineteen thirty-six, so yeah, just Basically. before the uh, just before the Sino, the Second Sino-Japanese War. So no, I I mean I don't really have anything to add, but uh, all right. Well, what was that? Oh uh, uh, no, I finished. Okay, all right. Uh, no, yeah. I have I have nothing either. I think that's a good good point to lead on to the war. Okay, so um. <laughs> If, uh, if our audience right now in the modern day could conceive of this, um, it seems like the Japanese have a uh, habit of starting wars under false pretexts of diplomatic incidents with their neighbors and uh, mm. then mercilessly invading them. Um, it sounds far-fetched to me. What about you guys? <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't know. I... I mean, how are we to even assume that these are false? I mean, they could. I mean, the Mukden incident. I thought I always was convinced was you know completely legitimate, and the the Japanese were acting proportionally. I, I don't know what you're trying to insinuate there, Ryan. <laughs> yes. um, I mean, you know, the 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 explosion was so tremendous that a train actually passed over the railway an hour later. I mean, it must have been awful. It was really a terrible incident. I can't, can't believe the perfidious Chinese would do something like that to the Japanese. <laughs> We can, why, would, uh, why would Chang do this to me? That's what Hirohito. Is. <laughs> we can uh, we can let the uh, reader understand or the watcher understand there. Um, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps these diplomatic incidents aren't always as they come across, uh, and maybe even uh, perhaps this isn't exclusive to the Japanese and the Chinese. Perhaps even this could be the case in the modern era. I know sounds terrifying, but. Um, with that, um, I think we're safe to say, uh, to summarize the Mukden incident, uh, 
Uh, there's an explosion on a rail, run, a rail line owned by the Japanese that is blamed on uh, Chinese nationalists. Um, this is uh, in Japanese media yeah, played up. Mukden in, in, in Manchuria. Right, right. And I'm trying to pull up a... Uh, can't really find a great map to show like war plans, but you know, we'll get to most of this, I'm sure. Um, you know, up in this region, you know, close to the border of China, there are multiple rail lines that will go out to Korea and to Siberia, uh, that will go up north and connect to areas connected to the uh Trans Siberian. Very important area. There is a according to Japanese media, a gigantic explosion uh that kills multiple people. Uh, caused by the evil Chinese nationalists trying to retake the, their possessions in Manchuria. And, you know, there's obviously only one way to respond to this. Uh, that's the brief overview. Um, would any of you like to paint in any details if they are uh, important? Um, I was going to say, somebody in chat has suggested we talk about the cooperation in this period between China and uh, Hitler's Germany. Um should we mention that because it's, yeah there we go because it's i think it's it's important to mention because um everybody of course associates the germans with the japanese due to the alliance during the war but um there, there's a lot of people see images from this time of chinese troops actually wearing um style helms um because of the german equipment and and uh training the army received and i, I know that Chang had an elite corps of, I think, about 300,000 German-trained troops um, who were basically all wasted in the Battle of Shanghai. Um, it's, I, would that be significant enough to mention? Well, I mean, it was enough to cause a diplomatic incident where the uh, Germans had, uh, if I remember correctly, von Falkenhausen. Von Falkenhausen yes, that's right. Um, that was uh, supposed to be modernizing the nationalist army in China, the Kuomintang uh, military force. Uh, and the Japanese uh, requested that the Germans withdraw him and also stop their financial support to the nationalists, which was also a thing at this time. And if I remember correctly, and you know, both of you are uh, much closer to the continent than I am, so perhaps you would know more just by the uh, history that you pick up by places closest to you. Uh, it was German uh, foreign policy at the time that a uh, German-aligned China would be better in terms of uh, just future outlook than necessarily a German-aligned Japan, uh, just because China had much more population, had much more uh, industrial potential. Um, the military that it could potentially field would be ginormous. The Japanese were kind of seen, uh, at least by the more... Uh, belligerent members of the world at this time as a, uh, you know, as in a uh, state of uh, fighting for survival, you know, trying to invade places for grain and oil to make sure they can keep the country afloat, whereas China could be uh, much more sufficient. But perhaps that is all just me uh, buying into narratives that are not necessarily true. AM, I'm sure you would have a lot to add on this uh, potential topic. Yes, well, the cooperation between the German army and or the Reichswehr before it became the Wehrmacht and China began before uh, Hitler was appointed chancellor. I believe it happened almost a decade uh, before. Indeed, there were German military advisors in the Soviet Union at the same time as an extension of the fact that the peace time army of Germany was restricted. And so many ambitious officers were able to basically be recruited as foreign adventurers. Regarding how this sort of worked out in China, you have to bear in mind that post the communist purge, Chiang Kai-shek's China made many sort of overtures of you know, symbolic overtures towards not necessarily Nazi Germany, but very much fascist Italy. So there wasn't necessarily a strategic reason in the early sort of 1933, 1934, 1935 for allying with Japan at all. And China represented that deep sort of continuity of cooperation. And also Hitler was personally suspicious of Japan as a purely opportunistic power who had confiscated the German international concessions as well. And there was still a lingering um, concern in Germany at the time as to what character would German uh, revanchism take? Would it be the creation of the, the sort of the German East European Empire, or would it be the restoration of the colonies? 
Um, so in this case, the Chinese are seen as the, the lesser of two evils. And German policy only really began to change in 1937, 1938, after the abduction of Chiang Kai-shek and the creation of the Second United Front. Right. And so I didn't realize that the cooperation went back to the uh, Weimar era, um, but that would make sense politically, just discarding the um, obvious need to ha have some sort of uh, professional military ongoing uh, to circumvent treaties. Um, because the Weimar era quite famously seems to have been dominated by social democrats and the more socialist leaning elements of German society. So um, the nationalists, uh, you know, obviously probably more conservative in some areas. Um, at least their stated goals seem to be more aligned, but is that just me being uh, simplistic there? Uh, no, I, I do believe their, um, their goals, at least in that time, were aligned. And it was only with the outbreak of war um, when Japan and China went to war in 1937 that continued German assistance to the Chinese forces would make Germany an effective co-belligerent. So the reality on the ground forced Germany to abandon China. And then we see the, you know, the, the anti-Soviet pact, the tripartite pact, and the fact that Japan was making not hostile overtures, not just against um, China, uh, but all Western powers in the East. And of course, this was a, you could say, a natural alliance post-1941 when Japan found itself at war with all of these countries and provided Hitler with a major distraction. Um, so I, I think it was it was forced on Germany, um, the fact that Germany had to split off from China during the outbreak of hostilities, but uh, certainly before then, uh, there was mutual advantage, it would seem. Alrighty, and uh, with that, uh, is there anything else we should add before we get into the uh, specifics of the Japanese invasion? Um... I mean, I suppose we could mention the um, rundown state of the Chinese army. Mm. Um, <laughs> out, out, outside of a few, um, as, as I said, there was an elite corps of about 300,000 German trained troops who were trained in modern tactics and quite well armed. Um, but the issue is that, of course, when we're, the, the scale we're talking about for 300,000 good troops isn't especially a lot. And the many, many more that made up the rest of the Chinese army were um, of varying quality, not particularly well equipped. Um, I mean, you read about some of the upcoming battles, especially urban warfare, which got absolutely desperate. Um, I know that there were, uh, there's, there's actually stories of um, when the Japanese were landing in Shanghai and, um, this, I mean, I, it may, may be apocryphal. I've, I've not seen, you know, pictorial evidence of it, but there's accounts of it, of uh, sort of Shanghai gangsters in their tuxedos with, you know, swords and axes and Tommy guns and things, you know, hold, trying to hold off the Japanese alongside uh, alongside um, regular troops. And um, I mean, you can tell basically by the scale of the amount of land that the Japanese are able to take, that the Chinese resistance is very much on the back foot despite um, superior, superiority in numbers. And very often their affairs behind the lines are um, not particularly good. Um, I believe that they suffered immensely from corruption. Um, so, for example, you know, it's very, very hard to fight a war of this scale when every province has got, you know, corrupt tax collectors and people fiddling the books and looting and abusing the populations behind the line and i don't want to jump too far ahead of myself but there is a reason that the communists were able to take hold so quickly after the war um and there is a lot of resentment i believe towards the um kmt uh as this as this drags on i think by comparison the japanese army was better trained better equipped intensely more professional um and uh had far higher morale um, I don't know if we want to cover the um, the various uh, atrocities or any particular key battles of the invasion. Um, um, well, yeah. actually, um, just being told um, that our uh, esteemed guests will have to leave soon. So I think we could probably just end on this note of the Japanese are invading China's in shambles and uh, things aren't really looking good. 
and, and we can. Yeah, I, I would call it a cliffhanger, but this is literally history. So, <laughs> what um, happens next? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, flip the page in the book. Um, but but I think we've set the stage. Um, you know, the traditional form of Chinese government is basically a memory now. Um, the regional uh, leftovers of the uh, sort of pseudo modernized uh, systems have taken over. Um, the nationalists have kind of supplanted some of them in some cases, and then allied with them in others. Um, and now there is a foreign power that is going to cause uh, some sort of unity between communists and nationalists. Uh, you know, the stage is set. Um, and if there's enough demand, we will gladly, uh, I would like to wrap this up sort of with the uh, communists given, uh, basically receiving Manchuria from the Soviets and, you know, uh, some interventions, let's call it, with the Americans that eventually caused them to be stronger than the nationalists. But um, mm. with that, I think the stage is set. Um, and just because AM has told me, uh, 10 minutes, I will, uh, keep, uh, anything extra to a minimum. And, uh, we will, uh, we had one super chat today from Wotan005 for 10 US dollars. Thank you, sir. Uh, he says, maybe I like Susan, uh, back when I was saying to you subscribe star, because we don't have to donate anything to Alphabet. Um, <laughs> I don't know why you would like Susan. That's got to be some sort of a Paul Fahrenheit level of a uh, of a uh, you know, gymnastic logics there. So uh, yeah, but thank you very much though for the for the donation. Uh, that is what allows me to continue uh, doing this. Um, uh, anything else that you all would like to add? Anything you'd like to pull out of the chat? Um, we do still have a few minutes left. Uh, um. I would say just thanks everyone for listening. Um, it's one of those topics where we have to get through an awful lot in just under a few hours. Um, uh, I think uh, very much appreciate um, AM for being the real workhorse of this stream. Um, really sort of pulling us through, I think. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I should. You know, yeah. The only reason that this topic in particular is happening is because of AM, uh, I should say. Um, I have been too busy to, you know, lay out something on my own, as I am as I think Panama ha has been as well. Um, so uh, we are entirely running off of the vast historical treasury of Apostolic Majesty here to uh, pull us through this in a quality manner. So thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure about that, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think all I'm doing is uh, causing whiplash for everyone who can't grasp whatever my particular area of study really is. Oh well, yeah. You know, at this point, um, if people really did not understand what we just went through, um, if we were unclear, uh, you now know of the things to go in search of, as opposed to just knowing things happened in China and being left at that. So. You know, if you thought that we did not cover the uh, Northern Expedition in enough detail, uh, now you at least know some places to look into uh, to go and study that further. And I do think that um, American shenanigans between 1945 and 1949 does warrant a closer examination than I'm currently capable in my state of doing. Well, so, uh... that would be where my knowledge can come in, uh, just because I, uh, I know what's happening on the American side of these things usually more than what's happening on the other side. Um, but yeah, we're leaving off right at the Japanese invasion. China's in shambles. They've uh, not had a very good last 150 years or no, I guess it'd be last 100 years, basically. But um, yeah, this is a, a good good place to leave off for a part two. Um, and if, of course, either of you two are interested and we do have one more super chat for five pounds sterling from Spasticus Autisticus. Uh, money for an amazing panel and an amazing stream. Thank you, sir. Um, I, uh, I, I, you know, when I was thinking about doing this topic, um, my original plan was to just have Panama Hat and I come here and kind of just brush through the historical details and talk about the philosophical implications of a, uh, of sort of exporting uh, very new Western ideas that are kind of themselves aberrations into a completely foreign culture. Uh, but, you know, not many people really read up on Chinese history, so I figured we could probably cover this and then get on to that at a later point. Um, this turned out much better than I thought it would, thanks to both of you. Uh, very little due to my own efforts. Um, so, yeah. Anything that you two would like to add, Shill, um, say, before we have to uh, sign off? Oh, nothing from me. Just uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, yes, thank you as well, and looking forward to part two. <laughs>
Yes, fantastic. And once again, uh, both of you have your own YouTube channels, your own media presences, uh, and I encourage our audience to go and check both of you out if you have not, if the, the audience has not done so already. Um, the quality of work on both of your guys' channel is uh, channels are uh, fantastic. So um, definitely do that. Their links are in this video's description. And hopefully, um, perhaps this next week, because I'm going to have exams uh, on Thursday, so I'm not going to really be able to plan for anything new and groundbreaking. Uh, perhaps we can carry this on next Saturday, or if not, whenever would be the next available time that works for both of you. Um, with all that, I think we're ready to sign off. So thank you for watching, everyone, and have a good rest of your morning. Goodbye, everyone.